now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. It is May 24th, 9 a.m. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Supervisor Friend. Here. Coonerty. Coonerty. Caput. Uh, Caput here. McPherson. Here. And Koenig. Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. We'll now have a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance. Does any board member wish to dedicate this moment to anyone or anything? Seeing none, a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Ceo Palacios, do we have any additions or deletions or deletions to the agenda today? Yes, we have a, a uh, number of corrections on the regular agenda, item number 12, on attachment A, pages 313, 315, 325, 326, 331, and 332 have all been replaced with new charts. On the consent agenda, item number 52, um, page 1023 subject should read, Adopt resolution authorizing sale and issuance of bonds. Page 1024, title of paragraph should read green bonds. Page 1026, end of first paragraph should stop with, quote, expected in early July, uh, unquote. On item 52, also staff requests that this item be moved from the consent agenda to the regular agenda. And that uh, concludes the revision sheet. Thank you. We'll then hear item 52 uh, as item 13.1 on the regular agenda. Does any board member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Uh, no, I have nothing to uh, remove, but I'll make a comment uh, when it comes time to vote. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. We'll proceed now to item five, public comment. Any person may address the board during its public comment period. Speakers must not exceed two minutes in length and uh, may speak once during public comment. All public comments must be directed to an item listed on today's consent agenda, closed session agenda, yet to be heard on the regular agenda or a topic not on the agenda that is within the jurisdiction of the board. Board members will not take actions or respond immediately to any public communication presented regarding topics not on the agenda, but may choose to follow up later, either individually or on a subsequent board or supervisor's agenda. And we also have an announcement from the clerk on how to participate. Now is the time for public comment. If you wish to comment and are joining us in chambers, please form a line down the center of the room and approach the podium to speak. If you are joining us through Zoom, please locate and click the hand icon on the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. You will be called by name when it is your turn to speak. Please state your name at the beginning of your comment. Once you begin, the countdown timer will display on screen and turn red when your time is up. If you are calling in by phone, please dial star nine now to raise your hand and join the virtual queue. I will identify you by the last four digits of your phone number. When called on, please dial star six to unmute yourself and then begin to speak. At the end of your time, your microphone will be muted automatically. Este es el momento del público para hacer sus comentarios a la Junta Directiva de Supervisores. Si usted desea hacer comentarios y nos acompaña en persona, por favor, póngase en fila en el centro del cuarto en dirección al podio. Si le gustaría dar su comentario en español, tenemos traductores disponibles para asistirle. Si se ha conectado a través de Zoom y desea dar su comentario, busque el icono de la mano en la parte de abajo de la pantalla y hágale clic para levantar la mano. Esto lo colocará en la lista de espera y cuando sea su turno de hablar, será llamado por su nombre. 
se abrirá una ventana en su pantalla en la cual se le preguntará si desea activar su micrófono. Presione aceptar y comience a hablar. Preséntese diciendo su nombre al principio de su comentario. Usted tendrá dos minutos para poder expresarse. Una vez que comience el cronómetro, usted podrá ver cómo la pantalla va a ir cambiando de color al irse culminando su tiempo. Si se ha unido a través del teléfono, por favor marque asterisco 9 para levantar la mano y colocar su llamada en la lista de espera para poder hablar. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, lo anunciaremos por los cuatro dígitos de su número de teléfono. En ese momento, por favor, marque asterisco 6 para activar su micrófono y comience a hablar. Preséntese y diga su nombre al principio de su comentario. Usted tendrá dos minutos para poder expresarse. Una vez que comience el cronómetro, usted podrá ver cómo la pantalla va cambiando de color al irse culminando su tiempo. Al final de su tiempo, su micrófono será desactivado automáticamente. Thank you. For, uh, we'll start, begin with folks in the chamber. Thank you. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. What is it? May 22nd or 24th? 24th. Um, maybe this will be my shortest feces sandwich. I'd really like to thank Greg Caput for a real consistency that uh, I really admire. This is a quote. I appeal to the chemist to discover a humane gas that will kill instantly and painlessly, deadly by all means, but humane, not cruel. George Bernard Shaw. Also, quote, I am a communist, but not a member of the Communist Party. Stalin is a first-rate Fabian, and I am one of the founders of Fabianism, and as such, very friendly to Russia. This was a quote, February 3rd, 1948. You know, what is the uh, London Fabian School of Economics? We have a current supervisor that's not running for re-election that went to that school. We have several people that are, I'm just going to skip that. Um, city mayors working diligently with the UN and US. Um, our city managers and our mayors and our county managers, they're not adhering to the state of California except the pirate state which is a gold, gold fringe flag, they're not uh, adhering to any real federal regulations. They're, they're doing the deeds of the philanthropic, philanthropic um, tax-exempt foundations and international entities like the UN. You know, there needs to be some accountability. There's stuff going on right now affecting all nation sovereignty. And you guys just seem to be rubber stamping all this stuff. You know, uh, the people that elected you, I think had entirely different expectations than what you guys are actually doing. So I would like to really thank the law enforcement that in this room today that took the time to talk to me and actually just thank me for being me. Um, I think that uh, law enforcement has a very important job and they're often not thanked enough. And next to children, they're being the ones that are thrown, being thrown under the bus by the people that control them. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Good morning. My name is Carol Bjorn. Um, and thank you for being here in person, Manu. And thank you, Greg and Bruce, for having your camera on. We, we, we appreciate that. Um, so at the beginning of the state of emergency on March 4th, 2020, um, we heard a lot of comparisons to the Spanish flu pandemic. Um, but I'm just curious how many people actually went back and looked at the facts of the Spanish flu pandemic to see what was really true, and what was really propaganda at that time, because the propaganda has continued since then. So I want to encourage everyone for your summer reading list um, to put this book, and I'm hoping this is on the camera for Facebook. Um, it's called The Truth About Contagion. It's by Dr. Thomas Cowan. And I wanna read just a short passage from this book. This is actually, um, the portion that I'm gonna read is from an article that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, August 2nd, 1919, pages 311 through 313. It's an article entitled Experiments to Determine Mode of Spread of Influenza. The, the 
the author is MJ Rosano. So, and there's a very extensive bibliography to this book. Um, okay. Uh, during the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, the deadliest example of a contagion in recent history, doctors struggled to explain the worldwide reach of the illness. It sickened an estimated 500 million people, about one third of the planet's population, and killed between 20 to 50 million people. It seemed to appear spontaneously in different parts of the world, striking the young and healthy, including many American servicemen. Some communities shut down schools, businesses, and theaters. People were ordered to wear masks and refrain from shaking hands to stop the contagion. But was it contagious? Health officials in those days believed that the cause of the Spanish flu was a microorganism called Pfeiffer's bacillus, and they were interested in the question of how the organism could spread so quickly. To answer that question, doctors from U.S. Public Health Service tried to infect 100 healthy volunteers between the ages of 18 and 25 by collecting mucus secretions from the noses. Thank you, Ms. Bjorn. Okay, no one got sick from that experiment, and it's all documented in the article I quoted, and it's in the book. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors, Mr. Koenig. Uh, my name is Damon Bruder. I'm a concerned citizen. I am also the chairperson of the Syringe Services Program Advisory Commission to the Board of Supervisors. I'm here uh, as as just a citizen, not representing that uh, that commission in in actuality. But I'm here to ask that the commissioners please have their staff reach out uh, to try and find more commissioners. This is supposed to be a seven member commission. We are down to four um, and we're having a very hard time meeting quorum for our, for our monthly meetings. Uh, we're tasked with, with helping achieve the best balanced harm reduction program for everyone in our county. And we can't do it if we can't have meetings, if we can't have quorum, if we can't vote, if we can't suggest changes. Please um, dig around, put the word out on your websites or at your meetings. We would really need, really like to have some more commissioners to help serve our public better. Thank you for allowing me. Thank you, Mr. Bruder. Gary Richard Arnold, uh, Chairman. Uh, I have a little vending product uh, that comes out of a vending machine. It's a little barrel with five little monkeys in it, and they all hang together. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Board of Supervisors, where you play musical chairs, uh, not only with uh, uh, being here at all, but with uh, such offices as the Sheriff and the uh, Gail Perlin. Apparently, everybody gets a raise, and then they abandon uh, their particular office. You appoint somebody, they run as an incumbent. Um, this, this is outrageous. Uh, you're totally at the mercy of uh, the organizations which that lady talked about earlier. Margaret Lopez is, uh, was appointed by you. She was paid by secret donors. She's a friend of Carlos Palacios and a co-member uh, of the uh, the the county uh, 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 so-called community foundation. Uh, what they didn't tell you about Margaret Lopez is that she was paid by uh, Ann McNulty, uh, who was the managing director of Goldman Sachs. Uh, she received an award, uh, this uh, uh, thing that uh, allowed her to organize Latin uh, college students uh, for political activities. She was an advisor to Google and Netflix, which is overwhelming with their, their censorship. Uh, Margaret Lopez had fascist control over which businesses were uh, essential and which weren't. Uh, some of these people that include uh, these donations to Margaret Lopez happen to be uh, Madeleine Albright, the Ford Foundation, who a congressional committee that they said their purpose is to so alter the U.S. that it could comfortably merge with that of the Soviet Union. We have people on the board, which was mentioned earlier, that Fabian socialist that believes they're, you know, they're a better communist than anybody else. We have Zach friends who worked for two previous communist uh, uh, lobbyists. Uh, he also worked for two different people from secret societies uh, from Yale that included John Kerry, whose son worked with Hunter Biden in his uh, getting gigs from China and the Ukraine. Thank you. Hello, distinguished board members. Um, I'm speaking on the consent item as it relates to the re rededication of the Willowbrook Park in honor of uh, Sergeant Damon Goodschuler. My name is Stephen Ryan and I'm a Sergeant for the Sheriff's Office here in Santa Cruz. I'd like to thank Supervisor Friend for pushing this matter forward. This gesture will serve as a tangible reminder to the community of Santa Cruz County of the sacrifice and legacy of Sergeant Damon Goodschuler. 
Damon's dedication and love for this county was clear to anyone who worked with him. Far before his tragic death forever cemented his selfless commitment. It is my hope that those who visit the Spark will see his name and be reminded of the commitment and sacrifice Damon made while thinking fondly of my friend and my brother. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Ryan. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner from Rural Aptos. I um, also support renaming the park to honor Sergeant Gutzweiler and his family. And I think it's a great project and I look forward to seeing him move forward. Um, I really wanna speak about um, item 15, the wireless ordinance. I have submitted written comment, but at the very least, this county needs to require all uh, telecommunications operators to submit annually the actual RF operational um, results. They can say one thing when they submit the application, but what happens is that often it is not um, the same as what is actually in operation. And there is no uh, uh, consideration of cumulative impacts within a neighborhood. So I would really like to see that added to this ordinance before it is signed into its approval. This is the second reading. There's nothing that's ever been required for follow-up on these installations. People are RF sensitive, some of us are, and we need to know where these installations are so we can avoid those areas and uh, please make those locations public. Um, on item 51, uh, taking a, affordable housing stock out of Measure J, this sets a very bad precedence for people who have Measure J units simply to not maintain them. And that appears to be what this case is on the East Ienti Road. The house was built in 1983, it's not that old. And that because the owner has who bought it in 1990, um, was not given the proper wording in their contract by the county to make them financially responsible for maintaining the property is now coming to fruition and the house is run down and the county simply wants to take it out of stock and let them sell it at market rate. Zillow lists market rate for that area as 649,000. May you. have one additional minute, please? There's a lot on the consent agenda. Uh, I'm sorry. I've all right. All, all well, I'm possible. sorry. Please do not take this out of affordable housing stock. I'm sure the county has money somewhere. Thank you. That you could at least uh, make it habitable and safe for another low-income family. Thank you. It sets a Thank very you. bad precedent. All right, I think that's everyone here in chambers. Is there anyone on Zoom? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor. Uh, Person. Yeah, I just like it's not on the <clears throat> the agenda, but I'd like to recognize um, Santa Cruz County for being recognized by the National Association of Counties for um, examining its uh, cross jurisdictional policing practices throughout the county. Um, this NACO is a nationwide agency uh, representing counties throughout uh, the United States. Uh, we have been at the front of the line before in our com community policing. Uh, efforts uh, years ago, and this year, um, and under the leadership of uh, Zach Friend on the Criminal Justice Council, uh, NACO recognized um, Santa Cruz County in this uh, groundbreaking uh, transparent review of cross-jurisdictional policing in our county. Uh, it's comprised of the district attorney, the chief probation officer, the public defender, County Superintendent of Schools, the President of Cabrillo College and the Superior Court, as well as the County Behavioral Health Director. I just want to applaud those who are involved in this. And I, show, I think it shows that the county is out in front and doing what we can to have transparent policing activities in Santa Cruz County. Um, I especially want to say thank you to our, our representative on the county board, Zach Friend, for his efforts in this. Um, it's really a big plus for Santa Cruz County. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Uh, we'll now continue with public comment from folks who are on Zoom. Thank you, Chair. We do have speakers. Jim Hart, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Board. Jim Hart, Sheriff Coroner. And I just want to comment on item 28, which is the dedication of the Willowbrook County Park in the name of Sergeant Damon Gutzwiller. And we're approaching the second anniversary of his murder that occurred on June 6th. And this is a very timely item. 
I, I, I want to thank Supervisor Zach Friend for his efforts on getting this park renamed and also the efforts of the parks director, Jeff Gaffney, as well as the fundraising efforts of the county parks friends, uh, the deputy sheriff's association uh, through donations from sheriff's office employees have committed $100,000 to this project. And uh, we, we continue to fundraise to make this happen. Uh, and I think it's an important project, it's something that the community is behind and appreciates and it's something that my staff appreciates it as well. So I just want to thank all those involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Hart. Rob Darrow, your microphone is now available. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Rob Darrow. I am the chair of Santa Cruz Pride. The first Santa Cruz Pride event in Santa Cruz County was in 1975, the third Pride event in the state of California behind San Francisco and Los Angeles. That year, the Santa Cruz Pride Committee reached out to the Board of Supervisors to proclaim June 16th to 23, 1975 as Gay Pride Week. The resolution that year narrowly passed by a vote of three to two. If I had time to request a similar proclamation from the current board, I'm sure that we would have a unanimous vote in favor. I'm here today to invite you to be part of the Santa Cruz Pride Parade and Festival on Sunday, June 5th in downtown Santa Cruz. In particular, if you'd like to be part of the parade, just let me know and I can create a space for you to be part of that. Um, it will be a family event along Pacific Avenue and you and your families are invited as well as the public. I also wanted to share that 2025 will be the 50th anniversary of Santa Cruz Pride. We look forward to working with future, the future board in making our 50th anniversary a big celebration across the county. Thank you for your ongoing work that you do to make Santa Cruz County the inclusive county that it is for LGBTQ plus people and for our diverse community. Thank you. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, the main purpose of elected officials is to protect the well being of the general public by your changing the wireless ordinance allowing the telecom industry to take over everything and radiate everything is doing the opposite. It's harming the general public. The I refer you to a document by Renette Senum, who is running for governor now. She is a former mayor of Nevada City twice. She did a PowerPoint pre presentation, why the rush to 5G, this was a couple of years ago, and she states millions, and this is what's happening in this county everywhere. Millions of so-called small cell transmitters will be installed both indoors and outdoors by 2025 to support the 4G, 5G, and up network. But here's the catch. There's no assurance that these transmitters are safe for public health, wildlife, insects, and plant life. 800,000. That's the number of new wireless transmitters required to build the new 5G network. Your vote should be rescinded. This should be stopped. She also states that 4G, 5G and the public right of way is a corporate and hostile takeover of our public right of way with no concern for public health and the environment. Vote no on item 17, and thank you, Greg Kappa, for voting no on these changes to the wireless ordinance on the May 10th agenda. You're the only thank one. You, Michael Lewis, your, your microphone is now available. This is Jean Brocklebank using uh, my husband, Michael Lewis's computer. 
right, uh, this is uh, regarding regular agenda item number nine. I'm greatly disappointed in the choice of a nine foot tetrapod to represent Live Oak history in the community for the Live Oak Library Annex project. Yes, the Harbor Jetty tetrapods were built on the property decades ago, but the artist's goal is to serve as an homage to the Santa Cruz Harbor and those who built it, not to serve as an homage to the Live Oak community where the Live Oak Annex will be built. Yesterday, I finally saw the other public art project submittals of several artists and was shocked that it appears the ugliest and most inappropriate piece for the Live Oak Annex was chosen, Library Annex was chosen. There was one submittal that beautifully represented a sense of place for the Live Oak community. It was a carved wooden panel that even managed to incorporate oak trees. Instead, the nine foot tall, nine foot wide tetrapod chosen represents the destruction of a coastal lagoon. And it's the antithesis of the county's climate action plan. Since concrete is one of the greatest greenhouse gas producers of the 21st century. Please understand I do not impugn the current harbor facility or its excellent administration. In fact, I was a harbor employee for 10 years and have the greatest respect for the harbor and all employees. That said, I ask that the board seriously consider not to approve the contract, nor approve the $95,000 of library, library Measure S funds. I ask that the choice of public art for the Live Oak Annex be reconsidered and another art project chosen, one that represents the Live Oak community, not the Harbor community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brocklebank. We have no further speakers for public comment, Chair. Right, thank you, then I'll uh, return it to the board for action on the consent agenda. And Mr. Chair, I'll make some comments if that's now is appropriate. Please, Supervisor Friend. Thank you. Um, just briefly on item 18, I'll be recording a no vote. Um, and on item 28, I greatly appreciate uh, the comments by the Sheriff's Office on this. This is a one of those situations where uh, even in great tragedy, we've been given an opportunity to provide the community and the family and the coworkers and friends of Sergeant Gutzweiler a place to reflect, a place to honor, but also a, a place of recreation and a place that he and his family used as recreation in a way that's reimagined and uh, really would live up to uh, the honor that he deserves. The work that we've done, not just on the fundraising side, but on the uh, already on the work that's been done there with the courts is really uh, an absolutely stunning reimagining of the park. And, and we anticipate within the next year that, you know, all these other elements will be completed. This is uh, a pretty significant step and, and a very strong statement by this board that a location that meant so much to his family and in fact a place where uh, he and Favi had some of their first dates uh, would be in an, an area that would be honored moving forward. And so I greatly appreciate the board's consideration of this, uh, of this park being uh, renamed in his honor and appreciate all of your consideration on that item. Um, on item 29, Supervisor or Chair Koenig, I just wanna appreciate your work on this for the not just on behalf of the mobile home commission but for on behalf of all of the mobile home residents in our community this is an important step and i appreciate your leadership in bringing that item forward on item 49 on the coastal uh, uh access item or their, their coastal encroachment policy, you know a lot of appreciation for the parks and open space and cultural services department and uh, I, I saw that we received a letter from the coastal commission in support of this item and I couldn't agree more that this is an important element for ensuring equity and access to the coast. You know, coastal California and, and the Coastal Act ensures that there be access to people of all backgrounds, all means and all opportunities. And, you know, as things have moved on over the course of the last few decades, it's, it's become even more difficult uh, for the coast to be an affordable location for people to be able to recreate and access. And so policies like this just ensure that the coast isn't just a coast for the select few, but but the access was provided to everybody. And so I'm very appreciative of this policy and I'm, and I'm glad to see uh, the, bat, the board have an opportunity to support it today. Um, on item 53, in regards to the Pajaro River, uh, just uh, continued appreciation for the work uh, of the entire region on behalf of trying to get that 
levy rebuilt. This is a small thing that the county can do to help uh, ensure that it happens. We are working very hard in appreciation also to Supervisor Caput for his work and outreach in the South County to make sure that people have that life safety and economic safety uh, project built. We've pulled some miracles out to get to where we are, both at the state and federal level, securing over $400 million in funding. Uh, so now this is our part to do the last the last little bit to pull us over the finish line. So I appreciate the board support on item 53. And lastly, on 58 and 61 for road repairs. Uh, these are still from the 2017 storm sets that caused over $120 million in damage. And, and as each of us know that suffered this damage within our districts and the, the constituents know even more than we do, uh, it's great to see Public Works continuing to fight to get that funding from the state and federal government associated with it, and even more importantly, to get these projects built. These two are very, very important for my district, and I appreciate the support of the board on those items and Public Works for the work on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Supervisor Kennedy. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple items just to comment on. First one, item number 20, I just want to take a moment of appreciation to the community, a supervisor friend, a sheriff part, uh, the Deputy Sheriff's Association, and everyone who pulled together to make this project happen. And it's an important uh, living memorial uh, for, for Sergeant Guts Waller. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's a powerful, beautiful thing. Item number 25, I just want to thank General Services for looking at how do we modernize our fleet, reduce our carbon footprint uh, as, an, as an institution. Institution. Um, I think it's a good step forward and I appreciate them taking the initiative. Item number 32, which is a Children's and Youth Bill of Rights. I want to take a second to uh, recognize in the city of Santa Cruz, Martine Watkins and Chevro Kalantari Johnson, who worked hard on this initiative, uh, and then human services staff, uh, who has also collaborated. And it's good to have a consistent countywide policy when we're making sure that we're uh, protecting and prioritizing children and youth in our community. On item number 33, I brought this item forward. Um, with the leaked opinion of uh, potential overturning of Roe v. Wade. I think it's important that our county make its voice heard, um, both from ensuring reproductive rights and women's rights uh, and potential impacts, especially on low-income communities across the country, but also for the rule of law and um, not overturning established law that's been in existence for 50 years. Uh, and so um, hopefully our federal legislators <coughs> will be, and state legislators will take action uh, in order to ensure those rights uh, through statute um, and not just leave it up to precedent. And then finally on item number 46, I just wanna recognize that the county is making a significant investment in workforce development and workforce uh, opportunity and um, these kinds of programs in a, dynamic economy uh, are incredibly important to get people um, working, uh, providing uh, for themselves and for their families, as well as having the dignity of work uh, as, they, uh, as, the, as they engage in both uh, nonprofit and for-profit institutions. <laughs> and this investment is incredibly important. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and item uh, number 28, uh, I think it's a wonderful project uh, uh, to renaming Willow uh, Brook Park, County Park, uh, in the name of uh, Damon Gutzweiler. And then uh, I want to thank, uh, on item 53, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Friend. We've been working hard on the Pajaro River uh, votes that will be coming up. Uh, it will be uh, decided, I think, around uh, June 8th. Uh, the ballots will be counted one day, I believe, after the, uh, the regular uh, election uh, for the people that are in the flood zone and the benefit area. And then uh, on item 33, uh, do I have to, uh, I just want to clarify it. If I have to remove an item to vote no on an item, uh, or can I just vote uh, when we have the consent agenda and, vo and voice uh, voting no on item 33? I'm pro-life. Uh, that's no surprise to people that I know. So um, anyway, uh, can I have a clarification on that? Supervisor Caput, you can uh, choose to vote no on a single item on the consent agenda without removing it. Okay, so I'll be voting uh, yes on the whole consent agenda, except no on item 33. Understood. 
uh, Mr. Go ahead, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, a couple items. Uh, number 21, the Wildlife Resiliency Advocacy. Appreciate the uh, continued sense of urgency and advocacy from our CEO to find funding for wildlife res resiliency collectively. Um, CAL FIRE and our fire chiefs have scoped uh, fuel reduction in projects that could really make a difference if the governor were to make the funding available and the legislature. Uh, the recent CAL FIRE grant award to the Resource Conservation District uh, of almost a million dollars to do a fuel break protecting Felton and Scotts Valley is a great example of that. And um, I really wanna thank the Resource Conservation District for its efforts in that. I also want to um, recognize item number 25, uh, the fleet uh, management lease agreement uh, is an example, really another example of the uh, county finding creative ways to uh, work smarter, more economically, and much more efficiently. Um, and it'll put it in a better direction with our fleet management and for positioning the county to eventually convert our fleet to electric vehicles. I too um, I really wanna thank uh, Supervisor Friend and everybody who contributed to the Willowbrook Park uh, dedication and uh, in honor of Sergeant Damon Gutzweiler, what a tremendous person he was. Uh, the people in that department just love the, the him. And uh, thank you for everything you did that uh, for that. And also Senator Laird who, um, who worked recently to um, for those um, who lost loved ones in the line of uh, du duty to have an eligibility gap in their survivor's benefit. Um, that was important. The, um, number number 55, the um, Measure D resurfacing project continues to go on. I wanna thank uh, the uh, Public Works for this report and a great job of managing our Measure D resurfacing programs for several years now and for adding streets in Ben Lomond in particular in my district in the latest round of work. Um, as we complete more end of this work throughout the county, I think it um, deepens our trust and confidence uh, that our residents have that uh, when we ask for support of measures like uh, 2016's Measure D, uh, we'll follow through with it and we're getting there. It takes a long time to come back from a multi hundred million dollar plus uh, effort that we need to address. And number 65, the uh, Bullock Creek Library lease. Um, I want to make sure the board and community know that what a wonderful reopening we had on May 7th for the Bullock Creek Library. The renovations were made and possible by 2016's passage of Measure S, um, as well as community contributions. And even if you don't live in uh, San Lorenzo Valley, I encourage everyone to visit Boulder Creek, the branch, to see the high quality of renovations that were done. Uh, my hats go off to everybody, and thank you, the voters who supported Measure S in 2016. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll add just a few comments and some additional, uh, propose some additional direction. On item 29, reinstating rental adjustment procedures for mobile home parks, this item was brought to my attention by the liaison for the Mobile and Manufactured Home Commission, uh, because mobile home park residents want the right to petition against rent increases restored. And I think that in light of the fact that tens of thousands of signatures have been collected for ballot initiatives, uh, courts are resuming in-person hearings, that it's definitely time for mobile home park residents to have their rights to uh, petition against rent increases restored. On item 41, authorizing the sheriff corner to sign the standard agreement with California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation for the fire camp program in the amount of $20,000 uh, as recommended by the sheriff corner. I just wanna take a moment because um, the fire camp program is I, I think an extremely valuable program and one that's um, really a, a bit underutilized at the moment. On the one hand, we've heard uh, about the challenges facing Cal Fire and our other fire uh, departments because of the shortage of line crews uh, who are available to, to help combat wildfires. Um, and uh, I've also heard from inmates who went through the program that it was extremely meaningful in, in helping them to turn around their lives uh, because they went for, literally from a, an inmate from you know being considered a menace to society uh, to being considered a savior, someone who had helped save small towns um, from destruction by fire. Um, and so I, I think we should look at opportunities really to leverage this program better. Um, the current contract is for up to 10 inmates, uh, but the budget really allows for, uh, is only budgeting for three um, folks to actually utilize the program. 
I would suggest that, uh, or provide additional direction, that in order to, to demonstrate our, our interest in expanding uh, the use utilization of this program, that we budget up to $35,000 per year. That would allow five inmates in total to, to utilize the program um, and direct the sheriff to return to our board if, if additional funds are needed to fill all 10 spots. On item 49, the report on the coastal encroachment policy. Um, I also wanna thank Parks for all their work on this. Uh, the um, proactive part of enforcing this policy was, uh, it was, as stated, was a pilot project this year. Um, and I think we saw some mixed results. Um, one of the big challenges was just in, um, you know, what what uh, all that has been, been built in the, the road apron, uh, which is being looked at for the encroachment uh, as, as being potentially in violation of the encroachment policy. And a lot of what we're seeing is that um, some of those encroachments do not actually, uh, would not actually facilitate access. So it's things uh, like mailboxes or it's in the space between two properties where there's actually not enough uh, space to create parking. And I think that's represented in the numbers uh, that says that of 43 properties reviewed, five, five parking spaces spaces have been created. Um, as you can imagine, I've heard uh, a, a lot of pushback from residents in this area because of uh, you know, the, some of the costs of uh, removing, um, removing post office boxes, et cetera. And, um, and also, uh, not, it's not entirely clear that that's what the post office wants either. Um, so I would just add additional direction here that we focus uh, on uh, that, that we allocate staff time only to the policy's stated goal of maximizing public access and recreational opportunities within the coastal zone and focus on encroachments that actually impede parking and or the public's ability to access the coast. And uh, those are, that's all my comments. Mr. Chair, I will move the consent with the additional direction that you proposed and uh, the understanding of the no vote that I have on item 18 and the no vote that Supervisor Caput recorded um, on the item that I actually unfortunately just blanked on, but on the two uh, requested no votes. 33, and I'll second that. Okay, uh, on uh, item 18, uh, I just want to clarify that uh, is, that's on the uh, setbacks. Uh, I'll be voting no on 18 also. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Friend, a second by Supervisor Coonerty, um, with the understanding that Supervisor Caput will be voting no on items 18 and 33, and Supervisor Friend will be voting no on item 18. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. <clears throat> Consent agenda passes with a note that item 18 passed three to five, registering a no vote from supervisors Friend and Caput, and item 33 passed four out of five, registering a no vote from supervisor Caput. Thank you, and with additional direction. Uh, we'll now proceed to item seven on the regular agenda, presentation by Central Coast Community Energy on the annual member agency update as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And for a presentation on this, we have Gabe Ruiz, Ruiz from uh, 3CE. And I think Gabe's joining us here in the chambers. Uh, so Ruiz, you can come up here when you're ready. You're welcome to take a seat. Oh, okay. Welcome. Uh, I believe your microphone needs to be turned on. It's the small gray button at the base of the microphone. Here we are. Thank you. Um, Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, my name is Gabe Ruiz. I am a senior commercial accounts manager with Central Coast Community Energy. Um, I'll be providing the annual report uh, this morning for the County of Santa Cruz. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if anything is not clear during my presentation, please feel free to interrupt and ask and happy to clarify anything, but happy to take questions at the end. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so, for, so for the community, many many of us here are aware, of course, um, of the Central Coast Community Energy and how we operate as a CCA. Um, but a couple key points to note is that we are one of 23 CCAs in the state of California serving 11 million customers. Uh, we have basically what we do is we come together as an agency in order to help serve our communities. We, we want to make sure that we are helping local governments reach their climate action goals. Uh, we provide residents and businesses with more energy options um, is also is really to ensure you know transparency when it comes to where your energy is coming from how the money is being spent and um, being very deliberate in our energy program so a, a big thing that you know the ccas do is you know giving community choice and options about how the bill they're paying for their generation is being spent next slide please so the way that it works um very simply I'm sorry if that the graph's not coming up right now. Um, but we have, what we do is we go out and we buy the power for our collective rate payers. Uh, this is delivered through the existing transmission lines um, with your investor owned utility. Um, but what we're doing is we are really taking charge of where that energy comes from, how that energy is being procured. Um, so it's really important for everyone to understand that, you know, we, we are going out, we are purchasing the electricity itself and getting sent to the grid, PG&E or, or I'm sorry, our Southern California Edison is in the, picking up that energy from there and delivering it to your homes and your businesses. Next slide. Perfect. So the agency itself is made up of 33 member agencies. These are the cities and counties that have elected to join Central Coast Community Energy. Uh, these are the 33 cities and counties uh, that have agreed to provide their communities with cleaner energy and to take an action in order to do so. Uh, the the um, CCE is CCCE is uh, the electricity provider for over 400 customers or 400,000 customers um, across the Central Coast. Geographically, we are the largest CCA in the state of California. Uh, we serve a very diverse community. We take part in um, all of our communities, uh, community-based organizations, chamber events. So we really have, we have a team that is dedicated to doing outreach to these groups and organizations, uh, making sure that they are aware um, of, you know, who Central Coast Community Energy is, and we can work with them in order to make sure that their members are aware of the advantages that Central Coast Community Energy offers. Um, I'm also pleased to announce that there's a 34th community that is elected to join Central Coast Community Energy. Uh, so this is the city of Atascadero recently voted uh, to join as a member. So we look very much forward to their enrollment. Next slide, please. And so the way that we are governed, we have a policy and operations board. Uh, this, these boards are made up of city managers, mayors, uh, council members, other elected officials, supervisors, of course. Um, and what the what the goal is is that you know they give us a direction. You know, they we come to them with a plan, and obviously they provide direction of what their communities need. Um, one thing that just to note is that the voting seats are determined by population and grouped by region. Um, also, we. We have our community advisory council. So the community advisory council is made up of you know quali really qualified and committed individuals. Uh, they have important connections again to that really diverse community that we serve. Uh, one of the things that they offer as an advisory body um, to the policy and operations board is recommendations on programs and community engagement. Next slide, please. Uh, so some of the accomplishments uh, that we have achieved, you know, really, you know, in the last 12 months, uh, right now we do hold a 94% enrollment of all of our customers and our eligible customers in our service area. Um, in the last 12 months, we have increased our signups to 3C Prime. That is our 100% cleaning renewal option by 40%. Uh, we have increased enrollment by 25%, again, making us the largest, geographically the largest CCA in the state of California. California. Uh, the agency right now has 38 um, full-time employees. Uh, we are between two offices in Monterey and San Luis Obispo, the main office being in Monterey. Um, also, you know, since 2018, uh, we have been able to devote $27 million. We have budgeted to vote through this year, uh, $27 million in energy programs, uh, providing over $50 million in customer savings, which I'll talk a, a, more, a little bit more about here as well. Um, um, 
and then also, uh, you know, really what we've done is our, our power, our power resource team has gone out and established contracts that have increased uh, the total megawatts from renewables by 94% and increased battery storage contracts by 23%. Um, and then one last note here as an accomplishment, uh, we have also received an A credit rating from the S&P. Uh, we are the first CCA in the state of California to receive that A credit rating. Um, so that just allows us, it, it's another tool in our belt and allows us to do more for our communities. Next slide. So clearly stated, as I believe many of us know, uh, that our goal is to reach 100% clean and renewable for all of our service area by 2030. Uh, we are on track right now to do to meet our 2025 goal. Um, so with the contracts that we currently have in place, uh, we are going to reach that 60% goal by 2025 as we continue to add more uh, contracts um, with uh, other clean energy providers. Uh, that is obviously going to work us closer and closer to that 100% goal by 2030. Next slide. Uh, and this is just a few of the PPAs, as you can see there from the graph, um, where we're at now in terms of executed PPAs, um, you can see the by getting us to that goal by 2025 to be 60%. Next slide. Next slide. So historically, just to talk about the rates here and the savings that we've provided historically to our customers in 2018, um, you went in March of 2018, we started with our commercial customers within the Tri-County, Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito. Um, we have always provided, you know, uh, we call it an IOU minus model. So the model was that whatever the investor owned utility rate is, uh, that we are going to take, you know, a discount of that rate. And that's what our customers will pay. Um, so we have followed that model. Model. Um, in the year of 2020, we started with a 7% discount. Um, obviously, due to COVID, um, we thought it was you know best way for us to serve our customers was to provide a 50% bill reduction. So we cut the generation rates on the bills in half for the month of May and June. Uh, that saved just about 24 million dollars to our customers just in those two months. Um, you know, at, I mean, at the time, you know, of course, nobody knew where exactly uh, COVID was taking us, but um, we felt that our board felt and unanimously voted um, that in order for us to support our community now, um, we would cut that bill in half for those two months. Uh, since then, we've provided a 2% discount uh, because from the reserve fund that we use to offset the charges for our customers, because the bill did need to be paid, but it came from the rate reserve fund, um, we have provided a 2% discount and building up that rate reserve fund. Next slide. So in saying that, um, also what we have here is our new rate structure. So we are now getting away from the IOU minus rate structure. Um, what we are doing is we have created a rate structure now that has started with for our customers March 1st. Um, but again, we want to simply put there predictable, simplicity, fairness, and still being competitive. So what we are doing is we're going out to see how our customers, um, you know, depending on the rate class they are, what does it cost us to actually actually serve our customer, right? And there's within the investor owned utilities, uh, there's a lot of cross subsidization. Some customers are paying less than what it actually costs them uh, to, to, to for, for their energy. Um, others pay quite a bit more. Um, so what we've done with the new model is try to create fairness um, and predictability also by setting a goal uh, to hold our rates for three years and then to reassess um, before that third year. Um, so that that is something that just to provide a little more stability when it comes to the generation portion of a customer's bill. Next slide, please. So a couple points here um, for the county. Um, you can see here we have just about where our enrollment is um, overall for the agency, um, but we have a 94, nearly 95 percent enrollment within the within the unincorporated county of Santa Cruz. Um, that is uh, 53,000 plus enrolled customers. Um, one of the things that we do with our you know our, our, our customers is the energy programs fund. So um, the electrified 
override. Uh, that number I have is still TBD. Um, the process that we currently have, it captures everybody within the city, or I'm sorry, the county of Santa Cruz. So even a city of Santa Cruz. So what we want to do is separate that out and say, what are the unincorporated customers? How much have they achieved from that electrifier ride? So that is something that I'll be able to share once we've kind of dove into that and made some changes um, within our internal system to identify that correct number. Um, but another one is the ag electrification program. Um, $90,000 has been devoted to that, um, you know, to customers within the unincorporated county of Santa Cruz. Um, so I, I myself, um, as a senior commercial accounts manager, Ag is a very important industry up and down the Central Coast. I work very closely with a lot of the large ag customers within our communities. And I think it's very important that, um, you know, this program, it, 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 it drives it, it drives a lot of thought and a lot of conversations with these companies that allows us to partner with them and gives us the ability to be more strategic. So um, very successful program. And I would say that the county um, and overall has done very well. Um, their, our customers have done very well with taking advantage of these money. Next slide. There's several other uh, energy programs that we have out this year. So right now we have, um, you know, for 2021, we have dedicated over $14 million for our 21-22 budget. Um, that's 4% of our operating revenue. Um, you can see the increases that have come there from over time. Uh, part of that has to do with um, us enrolling communities within San Luis Obispo County and Santa Barbara County as well. So that is increasing the funding that goes to our energy programs. Um, but this is a lot what we work with our with our community advisory council. This is very important to the agency. We want to make sure that the programs that we are designing fit and there is a need from the community. I think it's very important when we talk about new construction electrification, for example, that used to be we providing funding per unit for all electric housing. The way that we've changed that this year is now we have a new criteria, all electric and affordable housing. So it has to fall under that as well, because that's something that we change just by hearing from the need communications that we're hearing from various community-based organizations um, and, and, and other and other organizations that we work with. Um, so we thought that was something that we could strategically do to improve and create more affordable housing within our communities. Next slide. So Electrify Your Ride has really been kind of, it's kind of our premier program right now. There's $2.8 million dedicated to this program. Um, it, it, it covers much more than an electric vehicle. So it's commercial charging stations, it's at-home charging stations, um, it's e-bike program as well. So this provides and gives funding um, to make sure that people have access. We don't want the, you know, our goal is to lower GHG, GHGs. Um, we want to improve uh, the overall um, you know, looking at our communities and giving them accessibility. We don't want people to feel that, you know, having an EV is not something that they can afford. We don't want the, the, the perception that, you know, having an electric vehicle is only for people with money. So what we do is also we provide um, additional for income qualified customers. We double the incentive for them um, when it comes to purchasing an EV. So this has been really, this has been a really good program, a, a lot of uptake. Um, you know, we were, we're really having having a lot of good conversations with certain organizations that are pushing this program, making sure that people are aware. Next slide. And here's another program. Uh, so we are doing some front of the meter battery storage projects right now. We are working with, I believe the number is we had 15 of our member agencies originally submitted 90 sites um, for this program. So uh, but that is going to be our way of creating a more resilient, a more stable grid um, and really reducing the cost as well to our customers. That is a long-term goal. So working with our member agencies right now, um, going through the process of selecting these sites, where these projects are going to be. And um, yeah, we're really looking forward to this continuing and when there's more to share, I'm sure um, supervisor will hear about it. Next slide. Uh, another program that we are doing with our member agencies is the medium and heavy duty program. Um, just as an example, this is, so we have one member agency that is looking to purchase a uh, electric fire truck. So we're covering the difference of the cost of what it would be for a diesel truck 
compared to what that difference is for an electric truck. And we're covering um, that difference for them. So that's something that this program does. Street sweepers, we're in um, communications right now. We're having one-on-one -on -one meetings um, with all 33 member agencies. So we're very much looking forward to continuing these conversations and finding other ways this program fits everybody's needs. Next slide. And then part of our outreach um, and our engagement we do with the farm worker outreach and underserved communities. Um, so we have a we have a team that has been dedicated to um, you know performing these outreach events. Um, whether it's going out with you know I, I've been out with a labor crew in the Salinas Valley um, where we're actually getting closer and face to face to the people that need to trust us a little bit more. We need a little more. They, you know. It, we have a lot of, you know, we have our um, Spanish online, uh, Facebook. Um, we have other opportunities that we work with the different radio stations as well. Um, but really targeting, you know, these communities uh, and, and these customers to make sure that they are aware of the benefits that they can, you know, that this agency provides and they're able to take advantage of those. Because um, this this is, a, this is an important group of customers that live within our area um, that, you know, have need to know that they have access to these resources. Next slide. Just a couple more slides here. Um, so uh, another one, another thing that we're doing is we are working on an energy portal. Um, really what this is going to do is provide our customers with more access to, to in their information, how they're using energy, how they're spending money. Um, you know, we are, we're in the works right now of providing, we have a, a group of residential customers that have access to this right now. Um, I think it's really important for people to understand that, you know, this is going to grow and expand um, and it's going to give our customers, you know, they're going to be able to understand how am I using my energy? Why is my bill what my bill is? Um, not only for residential, but also eventually this will be for commercial customers as well. Next slide. Yeah, and another part of that, what they'll be able to do is look at the different services, but also when they apply for a program like our, um, let's say they apply for the electrifier ride and they applied for an electric bike rebate, they can go through the portal and see where they're standing in the program, if it's been processed or you know, where they're at um, in that process. Next slide. And, and then uh, lastly here, what we have is uh, we've done also a vendor registry. Um, you know, this is local money. This is community money when customers are paying their bills and we want to keep that money local. So what we're asking, working with some of our chambers and other business organizations um, is to get these local businesses registered in our vendor registry. So when we have a need for whether it's website services or legal services or whatever that might be, we can actually go to this registry of local businesses and select from there who, you know, we, that we can put out that RFP, our RFQ to see who can bid on um, those needs of the agency. Next slide. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. Other questions from members of the board? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just make a couple of comments. Um, the, um, the complexities associated, thank you, Mr. Ruiz, for the, uh, the presentation. Really well done. I appreciate that and appreciate the uh, the success of Triple C E. Uh, the complexities associated uh, with the business of running a government government governed utility um, really are enormous, and in some respects, are more complicated than the traditional business model of the investor-owned utilities or IOUs, such as uh, PG&E. Community choice energy agencies across California face constant pressure uh, all the time from proposed legislation and regulatory policies that are pushed uh, by the IOUs and others aimed at significantly compromising uh, Triple CE's uh, business model. Um, Central Coast Community Energy is really wise, I think, to focus on core goals and objectives that provide the greenest energy at the most affordable price uh, while continually reinvesting in the region through complementary energy programs, which is continually growing. I just want to thank the uh, the staff of Triple C E headquartered in Monterey for its um, enormous successes that we've had uh, since it became a reality. Uh, much appreciated. It's really a, a really great uh, asset to our community in the Central Coast. 
communities throughout from Santa Cruz to Santa Barbara County. So thank you very much for everything you've done. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Caput. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for the report also. Uh, I, I find it very interesting, the heavy duty uh, vehicle, uh, electrification, uh, uh, renewable energy, everything. Um, anyway, I, we, we have to protect our environment. And, you know, I'm not a scientist, but uh, just from looking at uh, throughout my lifetime, it's obvious that something has changed very radically, uh, radically in our uh, uh, environment. Uh, the, the hot winters when we never really uh, had uh, sun in the morning in uh, Watsonville area. And uh, so something's very wrong with, uh, uh, you know, our environment and we, we, we need to do something. I, I, hopefully this is going to help a lot. I'd like to see uh, electrification of passenger rail from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. So uh, maybe that's a possibility in the future also. Anyway, uh, thank you. I think we have a great uh, responsibility to the younger generation that uh, we do everything we can to uh, um, to make our environment as wonderful and beautiful as it is right now, uh, and that they're able to uh, also enjoy uh, living here in Santa Cruz County. And and we we have to protect what we have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Cabot. Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. I just want to note, I mean, I think I appreciate this outline and the proactive efforts to get this information and resources out to our community. Uh, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't point out that, um, but for the vision and hard work of Supervisor McPherson uh, and his staff, Jenny Johnson, who really brought this to fruition in our area through uh, just determined effort, um, we, none of this would be happening right now. And we'd be uh, having a far greater carbon footprint. We'd be making less investment in uh, electrification. We'd be uh, paying higher rates and seeing less for the, that money. And um, this is a, in a long career public service uh, super, that Supervisor McPherson's had, this is a crowning achievement um, that, that I hope all 34 uh, cities and counties uh, are grateful that, uh, that Santa Cruz was able to lead the way. Absolutely. Here, here, Mr. Chair, just to add to that, um, as we've worked for other regionalization efforts and looks at public safety and a number of other issues, um, everybody looks back to this as the model. And actually, realistically, everybody always says, how did Supervisor McPherson find a way to bring all these communities together and same with, with Jenny Johnson. So I just wanna echo what Supervisor Coonerty said, because these are very disparate communities throughout the Central Coast with a lot of different interests, a lot of different ideologies, and they all came together around this idea for a model of how to do this moving forward. And so um, I don't think there could have been a, another voice other than Supervisor McPherson to actually lead that effort, but I appreciate this presentation as well. It shows not just the successes, but what's possible as we move forward uh, as a region on this issue. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. I have a couple questions for you, Mr. Ruiz. Um, the Electrify Your Ride program is really fantastic. And I mean, yeah. I can, as we all experience more pain at the pump uh, and, you know, it costs $80 more to fill up your tank. I can think of no faster way uh, to deal with that than uh, using a small electric vehicle like an e-bike um, for more of your trips. Um, and, uh, you know, so I'm, if anything, I'm looking at ways that we can actually get this more people to utilize this program. Um, the first question is, uh, have you considered adding more vehicle types like uh, small electric scooters, um, you know, Vespa type things, et cetera, to the program so that um, people have an options? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I did neglect that. Um, E-motorcycles are also part of that program. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had a lot of applications in that area. Um, E-bikes have been extremely popular, mm -hmm. um, I would say. But um, I, I believe those types of vehicles, um, you know, E-bike, scooter would relate, um, you know, Vespa, E-motorcycle would relate. So I think believe those opportunities are open to the public currently. Okay, so so an e-scooter like a bird or a lime scooter would qualify today. I don't, I don't know that for definitely, but 
I would imagine so with, um, you know, I would believe it falls under an e-bike, you know, I would, I would assume that that's fair to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, and we want to be, you know, if this is something that somebody wants and they want to take advantage of the, we want people to take advantage of this money. We want them to take advantage of this program. So I would imagine that's something that we could talk to, you know, that customer who applies for the program about if, um, if there were any hurdles they needed it. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll encourage applications. Yep. <laughs> um, the other thing we're looking at is ways to, because it is a rebate program. So for working class or low income folks, it's still hard to pay that upfront amount of, you know, what can be $1,000, $2,000 or more for, for, uh, for a bike. Um, so we're looking at ways to try to get, you know, upfront capital available to help people purchase and then take advantage of the rebates. Yeah. Um, it, I will say one, one, one of the things that is really nice about the website and what our, our, our marketing team has done is that they've actually, there's a lot of different programs out there. There's a lot of different um, agencies, organizations that offer, you know, rebates um, it, for purchasing electric vehicles um, and e-bike, other e-bike programs are coming out as well. Um, but we put those electric vehicle programs, we put a link to all of those. So you can go to a separate link outside of um, Central Coast Community Energy's website and and you can actually see all the programs that are available to you within your region. Hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, my other question is about uh, net energy metering as we transition from uh, what's, what's referred to as NAM for net energy metering two to net NAM three. Um, do you anticipate that having a big impact on you know, the rate of expansion of residential solar, particularly? Um, and how do you plan to deal with that? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it, in all honesty, we don't have a stance on them three. Um, it's something that is, you know, obviously, you know, being decided at the CPUC level. Um, we are not governed by the CPUC. Um, we are governed by our boards. Um, but I think where we see how we can help those customers and really the state at large is looking at these battery storage projects that we're doing right now. There's too much solar on the grid at certain times of the day. Um, it goes to waste. Um, I think the focus that we have, especially what we're doing with our member agencies and some of these front of the meter battery storage projects um, that we're looking at, um, that is where I, I believe that we can play our, our role. Um, I, I can't comment on M3. Uh, it's just not, it's just, it's more for us. It's like, we just have to really kind of, you know, we can write letters of support for certain areas and, and things like that, that, you know, our agency does believe in and, and join with other agencies within the state. Um, but it is something that is told to us um, eventually. So sorry, that doesn't quite answer your question, but I do believe the role the way that we can support that um, is with these battery projects that we're doing. Got it. Thank you. Um, and with the requirement for new homes to be uh, to be built um, with solar panels in the state, um, do you anticipate this will significantly increase the supply of uh, solar power, or are there other policies we should be pursuing to enable that? Um, I would say that you know um, you you're going to see with the any increase in solar, I just think needs to be balanced, um, and I think that's where we again going kind of back to the battery storage, right? Where I, I think we we were there wasn't a balance to the amount of solar that was being put onto the grid, at, you know, and especially at you know middle of the summer, middle of the day in the summer. Um, but I, I I believe that with our focus around battery storage, um, that that's that's really where again, we can play our role in that, um, you know, with, with our new construction electrification program it does not require solar just requires that, you know, you build all electric, you no know, gas lines within the new, you know, within the, within the units themselves. Um, and, you know, again, of course, affordable is part of the program as well. It needs to be affordable housing, but, um, yeah, in terms of that, that's, you know, in terms of new housing, new construction, um, that's where our focus is. All right, thank you. Chair, Chair Koenig, uh, if I could interrupt real quick, just to, uh, on your question, um, the prior question with regard to the battery storage um, in terms of making solar energy more available, because we do overproduce in California during the day and then we have issues at night. Uh, so we're doing this project as part of 3CE to do uh, distributed battery storage. And Santa Cruz County does have three sites that are uh, finalists for consideration right now. One of them is on Freedom uh, Campus. The other one is on the new Westridge Campus. 
and the other one is on Ameline. And the idea would be that they would have be a site for battery storage uh, that would enhance the reliability of the whole system. These are the front of the meter storage, uh, battery storage projects. So we're, again, trying to lead the way and with other jurisdictions and, and providing sites for those storage projects. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. All right, if there are no further comments or questions from the board, we'll open it to public comment. Is anyone here in chambers that wishes to comment on this item, please approach the podium. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for this report. And thank you, uh, CAO Palacio, for that information about the county leading the way with battery storage. I would also like to ask that the Simkin Swim Center area be added to that potential campus of uh, battery storage. I'm um, I'm interested in where these 15 other sites that have been submitted to your agency are. I I am aware that the Moss Landing site is one of the largest battery storage sites in the world. So um, I'm I'm interested in in seeing how this will grow. I'm glad that there is a surplus of, of solar energy that people are taking advantage of that and I'm anxious to see it stored. Um, I support and applaud Supervisor Caput for talking about electrification of um, public transportation, whether it be on the rail or on the highway. I would like to ask if uh, 3CE can work with Metro to get more electric buses on our road, especially the Highway 17 bus, and maybe even put an electric bus that can operate on the rail um, in the corridor to uh, help provide ease on Highway 1 traffic. I wonder if um, 3CE can support PG&E and um, Edison by undergrounding transmission lines. You depend on them to deliver your product and yet they are a threat for wildfire. If they could be, if you could support the upgrade of them being either undergrounded or adding the uh, ground fault interrupters to make them more safe so that we don't have power shutoffs wholesale throughout the state. That would be a terrific improvement for both the environment and your customers. Um, I support that you are uh, working toward uh, microgrid electrification projects. Kind of I'm ridiculous. curious about where this electric fire truck is going to be. I want to know where that is. <laughs> and um, also note uh, that I'm curious to see how the cost in three years will increase to rural power customers. You're looking at the cost for actually supplying them the, the product. Steinberg. <laughs> And finally, I will just say that I had the great pleasure of seeing the wind turbines in the city of Soledad and found out that they are supplying 100% of the energy needed for their wastewater treatment plant. That's commendable. I'd like to see more of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So anyone on Zoom wishing to comment on this item? We do have speakers. One moment, please. David Brody, your microphone is now available. Hi, thank you. I'll be brief. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking on this item today, but uh, I just wanted to join in Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Friend's uh, recognition of Supervisor McPherson's leadership on this issue. It's truly amazing to me that this program has been delivered to our region and to our county. And um, frankly, when my, my older daughter asked me what we're doing to decarbonize our economy uh, in, the, in, in, in the Central Coast, this is the first thing I point to. So I thank you, Supervisor McPherson, for this. And, you know, with my day job hat on, what more could we be doing for our next generation than, than really cleaning up our energy profile and decarbonizing uh, our energy use in the Central Coast? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brody. We have no further public comment speakers. All right, then I'll return it to the board. This is an informational item only, so I don't think that any action is required. Um, so with that, I'll thank you for coming and presenting today, Mr. Ruiz, very informative. We'll now proceed to item eight, 
consider authorizing the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector to proceed with necessary actions to secure the 2022-23 tax and revenue anticipation notes in an amount not to exceed $48 million. Adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of 2022-2023 tax and revenue anticipation notes, approving the execution and delivery of a continuing disclosure certificate, approving the form of the official statement and note purchase agreement, approving the distribution of a preliminary official statement and an official statement and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the auditor controller treasurer tax collector and here for a report on this item we have the auditor controller treasurer tax collector herself with miss edith driscoll thank you good morning chair koenig and members of the board Edith Briscoe, Auditor Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector. Also joining us this morning via Zoom is Suzanne Harold, the County's Municipal Financial Advisor on this note issuance. The item before your board today is a request to authorize the County Auditor Controller to proceed with necessary actions to secure its annual tax and revenue anticipation note in an amount not to exceed $48 million. This note is being issued because counties have inconsistencies between when property taxes are received and when expenditures need to be paid. Taxes are the county's largest funding source and they are received primarily in December and April. Yet the county begins paying its budgeted expenditures as early as July 1. This note issuance, also referred to as a TRAN, is issued at the beginning of the fiscal year and paid off within 364 days with funds that are set aside during the year as tax revenues are received by the county. Regarding the method of sale for this year's TRAN, our municipal advisor is recommending the notes be sold using a competitive sale. However, the resolution presented to your board today does allow for the county to switch to a negotiated sale if market conditions deteriorate. As in prior years, the county's fiscal team will make presentations to Standard & Poor's and Moody's to obtain a rating for the note. The county's past short-term bond ratings from these agencies were at the highest level. No changes in these rates are anticipated. In addition to the current year tax flow concerns, this TRAN also provides funding to cover a portion of the prior year tax delinquencies that the county has already distributed to cities and agencies. The county is a part of the teeter plan and under the teeter plan, the county distributes property tax revenue to the cities and agencies based upon the total amount expected with no adjustment for unpaid or late tax payments. This provides the entities with consistent guaranteed cash flow, and in exchange, the county receives the penalties and interest on these delinquent taxes when they are ultimately collected. In summary, I request that you approve the recommended actions necessary to secure the 22-23 tax and revenue anticipation notes in amount not to exceed $48 million. This concludes my presentation. Both myself and Suzanne Harold, our financial advisor, are available for any questions. Thank you. Are there questions from members of the board? Supervisor Caput. I'll just say uh, thank you for the report and uh, I uh, tr uh, trust your uh, judgment, um, uh, Edith, uh, and uh, keep up the good work. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. for approval after uh, the comments. All right, well, if there are no further comments or questions from members of the board, we'll open it for public comment. Please approach the podium. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. I have a question that I would like answered. What is, um, how does the $48 million sum compare with um, prior years that the county has had to borrow? And I understand this is an annual thing that, that the county needs to do. But how does this level compare with previous years? And also, how does the level of uh, delinquent taxes compare this year with prior years? I would like an answer, if I may, please. Thank you. Other, other comments on Zoom? We have no speakers on this item for Zoom. OK, thank you. Um, that would be curious if you could sure, respond to the questions. Sure, happy to provide questions. that information. 
Um, we usually are right around 48, between 45 and 48 million. I believe last year we were at 48.5. We are hedging a little bit because of course our FEMA reimbursements um, are coming in slowly and FEMA reimbursements are cash flow to me. So I need to be able to, to know when to plan on that money. So the last five years we've been in the same uh, range. And regarding delinquency rates, we again also are not seeing a large change between the last few years. I don't have those numbers here, um, but we do provide that to the board whenever asked, and I'd be happy to provide a report. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll return to the board for action. We'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Or we'll have, we can allow Supervisor Cap to second. And also, Mr. Chair, I believe item 13.1, which was pulled uh, from con the reg consent agenda, the regular agenda, maybe we should hear it next, given the fact that it would be the similar staff for these items. Sure. Um, all right, so we have a motion by Supervisor Kennedy, a second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, I think that uh, Supervisor Friend's suggestion is a good one. If there's no uh, legal issues with that, um, we will hear item, um, sorry, was it 13.1 uh, will now be 8.1. And for presentation on this item, our uh, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure, Matt Machado. Thank you, Chair Koenig and board members. Uh, the item before you is uh, a resolution authorizing the sale and issuance of bonds for our uh, Santa Cruz County Sanitation District. And with us this morning is our bond advisor, Suzanne Harrell. She'll be giving us a PowerPoint presentation and she will also be available to answer any questions that the board may have. So I will turn the microphone over to Suzanne. So, Good morning, uh, Chair and members of the board. I'm assuming you can hear me and see me just fine. Um, so we'll start with, uh, if we could advance to the first slide. Thank you. Uh, so the Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority was created uh, to assist the county and its related entities with financing needs. And the Santa Cruz County Sanitation District has requested assistance with financing approximately $20 million of capital projects. To accomplish this, the authority would enter into an installment purchase agreement with the district. The district would make installment payments from its net sewer revenues. And then the authority would use those installment payments to secure revenue bonds that would be issued to the investing public. Next slide. The projects that are expected to be funded with the proceeds of the bonds uh, are about $20 million, um, 22.3 actually, uh, for five separate projects. Um, some of it will be funded with um, uh, available funding of the sanitation district. So the net proceeds to uh, be raised for the projects are $20 million. And you can see there's a little schedule here uh, when the bids are gonna be open on the various projects, when the construction will start and when it'll be complete. It should be all complete within two years. Next slide. Uh, the terms of the bonds, uh, we anticipate they'll be sold at competitive sale. We have um, started the process to get a green bond designation from a third party independent verifier uh, for these bonds. We expect them to have a 30 year maturity. Hopefully the bonds will have a double A plus rating, which is consistent with the last bond issue. Um, unfortunately, rates keep going up. So, uh, you know, about a month ago, the rate was expected to be 4.2% effective. Um, now it's, uh, as of last week, it had gone up to 4.28%. Uh, we did present this to the Sanitation District Board uh, last week, so they are also aware of, of uh, what's happening with interest rates. Next slide. So for the bond approval, uh, the authority resolution will approve a trust indenture, an installment purchase agreement, a preliminary official statement, an official notice of sale, and, a de and designation of the bonds as green bonds. Um, it also authorizes various officers to take actions in connection with the issuance of the bonds and issue the bonds in an amount not to exceed $25 million. Um, again, I mentioned the district adopted its own resolution 
uh, on May 19th uh, for the uh, the documents required uh, on their end for completion of financing. So next slide. So the recommendation is to adopt the resolution authorizing the sale, issuance, and delivery of a series of revenue bonds, approving the execution and delivery of a trust indenture, an installment purchase agreement, official notice of sale, and a preliminary official statement, and authorizing certain other matters related thereto. Uh, and that concludes the presentation, so I'm available for questions if there are any. Thank you. Questions from members of the board? Seeing none, I'll just add um, that these three projects, uh, you know, they, they all fall within my district, but um, they're incredibly important. And the Sanitation uh, District Board of Directors agreed um, universally to advance this uh, this bond issuance. Um, and I think it's a good investment in infrastructure that will really um, literally lay the groundwork for uh, more housing development within the middle of our county. I'll right, we'll take it to the public. Any member of the public that wishes to comment on this item, please approach the podium or raise your hand if you're on Zoom. Go ahead. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Rural Aptos. Um, I am really glad this got taken off the consent agenda. <laughs> this does not meet the standards of being on the consent agenda. So thank you to whichever supervisor it was that pulled it. Um, $20 million bond financing is a lot of money, but this is a very necessary improvement, a large capital improvement for our county, especially looking at the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan and general plan update that will really add a lot of housing, dense housing in the Live Oak area, but also the Sea Cliff area in Aptos. I am aware there is a current sewer connection moratorium in the Rodeo Gulch Basin. And that was brought up um, regarding the Kaiser project. So what I wanna know is what developer fees would be required of Kaiser, um, because that will be a huge impact on that um, moratorium area. And I feel like they should be helping pay for this as well as the um, redo of the 41st Avenue mall that may be including uh, dense affordable housing or housing in general. Is the city of Capitola going to um, assist with the cost of doing some of these uh, major capital improvements? I'm amazed that this will all be done in two years. That is phenomenal. <laughs> and um, I, I, I applaud the county for going in a, a direction to get the, the problem addressed. Um, I am concerned as a taxpayer about taking on this kind of debt as we move in further to inflationary times and more taxes. But um, I would like to see some of these large developers also pay in and the city of Santa Cruz uh, of Capitola. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Steinberger. Are there any comments on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom. All right. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, Director Mashak, speak a little bit to the way this uh, bond wealth may be paid for, you know, versus development versus regular rate payers. Sure, absolutely. So uh, the bond is built into our financial models, built into our sanitation district um, uh, rates and budget uh, with regard to uh, who pays for uh, those impact fees as reference, it's actually a connection fee. And so uh, Kaiser, uh, if they move forward or when they move forward, they will be paying their fair share through a connection fee. And that's also true for uh, any other development projects. Everybody pays based upon their capacity that they need for their project. It is true that these projects uh, will lift that moratorium. And so that is exciting news for our entire region. And uh, we do know it's an aggressive schedule, but we also know that we've been working on these projects for, for a few years, uh, getting clearances and getting designs complete. Uh, and so we do think it's a realistic goal. So any other questions I can try to answer? That's it, thank you. All right, um, I'll return to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? 
Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll proceed to item nine, consider selection of Marilyn Kukst as the public artist for the Live Oak Library Annex project, adopt resolution accepting unanticipated re revenue in the amount of $95,000 from Measure S funding, approve agreement with Marilyn Kukst for an amount not to exceed $85,000 and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Parks, Open Spaces and Cultural Services. For presentation on this item, uh, we have a few presenters, Kathy DeWild, our program coordinator um, for uh, the arts program, Amy Miyakusu, arts commissioner, and Marilyn Kukst, the artist herself. <coughs> Which one of you, I believe you're all joining on Zoom, which one of you is starting? Ms. DeWild, go ahead. Kathy, you have been promoted to a panelist, so you should be able to accept the unmute and begin speaking. Oh, sorry, good morning. Good morning, Chair Koenig and members of the board. Uh, I am Kathy DeWild, Arts Program Coordinator for Santa Cruz County Parks. Um, your board has previously approved the concept of placing a public art component at both the Live Oak Library Annex and the Aptos Library. In December of 2021, the Arts Commission formed an art selection panel for both of these projects and a call to artists was issued for the creation of original public artworks for each. It is now my pleasure to introduce Arts Commissioner Amy Miyakusu, who will tell you about the selection process for each of these two library projects, after which the artists will speak about their proposals. Thank you. Amy? Good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is Amy Miyakusu, and I am an Arts Commissioner for Santa Cruz County. Uh, the Arts Commission is pleased to recommend for your approval today an artist proposal for the Live Oak Library Annex. A call for artists went out in December of 2021 and an art selection panel was convened. The art selection panel was composed of community members, professional artists, uh, county arts commissioners, as well as the project manager. This panel met in February of this year to review the proposals submitted by the artist. Uh, two different artists were chosen to continue in the selection process by meeting with the panel where they were asked a series of questions about their concept proposal. In addition, the artists asked, were asked to present detailed drawings to further explain these proposals. Um, after much deliberation, uh, the panel chose Marilyn Cooks to continue in the selection process. And at the March 7th meeting, the Arts Commission reviewed the panel's decision and voted to recommend to your board to approve the selection of Ms. Kust for the public artist uh, for the Live Oak Library Annex. I would allow, excuse me, now like to introduce Ms. Cooks for um, to give a brief presentation of her proposal and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm very pleased to be working with uh, the county on this project. Uh, it's, it's truly a pleasure. Um, I have selected uh, as my project a sculpture that is a basic an homage to the builders and uh, uh, people who work with the, the harbor through uh, doing an abstract stylized takeoff on the uh, tetrapods at the harbor. They're very iconic. Uh, I love the shapes themselves uh, and was happy to be able to apply that uh, basic design into something of a more geometric uh, geometric shape. Uh, I feel that uh, the beauty of the building is very soft and curvy and that a more angular design would complement that very much. Um, uh, as you have in your package, you know that the sculpture is proposed to be approximately nine feet tall, which seems big if you're thinking of it in a room, but if you're thinking of it outdoors, it really, it gets smaller very fast. Uh, you've seen the photo. I very briefly brought a little maquette. Um, to show that it is not as static as it might appear in a in one photograph. Uh, some have suggested it's a little hard for some people to see how it's uh, related to tetrapods at the harbor, but I think if you, with a simple re reorientation, you can see that it's very, it's close in design, uh, but more stylized to be what I consider a, a more artistic design for this purpose. So with that, I think I'll, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Just a, a couple of questions. Would the proposed um, structure be climbable? Or if not, would measures be taken to discourage people from climbing on it? It is not a very climbable design. Uh, when you scale it, you'd have to be uh, climbing at a very odd angle up over six feet. So it, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, we talked about different angles, actually, like uh, orienting it like so to actually make it more climbable, but the selection committee chose the other, as I call it, more flying orientation instead, but I, I don't anticipate any safety issues. Okay, and I see in the um, mock-up that uh, you're presenting there, that all of the sides of the tetrapod are the same length, uh, whereas I, I think one version of it had, it was one of the legs was more extended, the one it was standing on, is that the final proposal that you have in front of you? It's it's more of an optical illusion, depending on the orientation. They are all approximately the same the same uh, length. the The issue is, uh, see, the angle that the tips are cut at will change a little bit, and I may modify those a little bit more to add a little extra grace to the to the design as well. But they're all approximately a little over four feet in in length. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and if the structure was lying in such a way that it was easier for people to to climb on one of the legs and slide on it, would would the materials wear in a way? Like, I mean, if it's made out of metal, would they be smooth, and would that be a you know, or would that become an issue? Uh, I, sh I should have addressed the materials. It's proposed to be a Corten-like steel, which is a self-rusting steel. Uh, so the surface will be rust. Uh, if you climbed on it and slid on it, uh, you might get a little bit of rust on your clothing, but that's a, that's about it. It's, you know, structurally, it'll be extremely durable and will outlive me by many, many years. Okay, thank you. Um, I do also just have a couple of questions for Ms. DeWild. Um, I noticed in the call for artists that um, specifically outdoor pieces were called for. Um, and I, that does significantly limit um, the type of art that was considered. Um, you know, I was just thinking back to, uh, I believe it was our last meeting where we heard from many members of the public um, about the new, uh, the Felton Library and the old uh, artwork there with uh, some human some human faces that people really resonated with. Um, so, you know, obviously any any painting or anything else that would have to be outside would face issues of degradation. Um, you know, how was it determined that this had to be only an outdoor work or uh, is there a, a, anything that actually requires that it be outdoors only? Hello. Um... The uh, I, I actually um, asked for direction from the project manager about what might work best for the public art project. So while while there was um, in the call to artists uh, a direction that outdoor public art pieces would be preferred, certainly artists were welcome to uh, submit proposals that included an indoor piece if if they so desired. So uh, it was more of a, just a, a preferred direction. I see. Um, and do we currently maintain an existing collection of, of county artwork? We do. There's a county collection of two-dimensional pieces, um, paintings, uh, sculptures as well. And also the county collection includes all of the public art pieces. And are there natural places around uh, with, with at the Live Oak Library Annex to display art uh, of any kind? Or, you know, I, I had trouble reading the map of where exactly this would be. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, are you asking if pieces from the county collection could be displayed inside the new annex? Yeah, or, or outside if any are appropriate. Um, I'm, you know, I'm wondering what the ability is for some, any kind of rotating art collection uh, outdoors or indoors. Uh, certainly, um, there's an opportunity for um, rotating exhibitions of artists' work inside the annex. So I would be happy to work with um, the library staff and um, park staff to um, determine what that might look like. 
and uh, and absolutely pieces from the county art collection could be um, exhibited inside the library annex if that's the direction they wanted to go. In terms of outdoor pieces, um, it's it's possible, but we need to look at where very carefully where those might be placed. Um, because uh, because it's uh, from what I understand, there's a lot of there's a lot of hardscape. There may be some planting areas. The pieces in the collection that are three dimensional are ceramic, so those would not be appropriate. And and most of the others are smaller pieces. Thank you. And would um, would support for a rotating art exhibition require uh, is that within your budget today, or would it require additional funds? Um. It would not be within today for within today's budget. It would be part of what Parks does and what I do, which is to facilitate exhibition of artwork in county facilities. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I mean, I'll just say, you know, um, for uh, the artist Ms. Cooks, um, I, I really like you. personally. I, I like uh, your proposed artwork. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of, of work of Richard Serra of you know large um, metal structures, which I um, I think are very interesting. And um, I, I like the contrast with the building, as you said, from a, a pointy structure to a smooth one. Um, I, you know, I guess my only concern here is that uh, it feels like the reference to live oak history itself is a, a bit obtuse. Um, and, uh, you know, because it's specifically to the Harbor and, um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how much it actually really celebrates live Oaks culture itself. So, um, if you'd like to respond to that, you can, although it's not necessary. Um, I'd be happy to just make a quick comment. I should also have mentioned that, um, uh, uh, I understand that, that, as you said, it's a little bit obtuse in certain aspects, and that's why I did propose uh, signage to show uh, images uh, to go along with the sculpture uh, so that they would show uh, a tetrapod at the harbor and kind of uh, how it evolved into to this design. And one of the reasons I chose the harbor uh, is, is in the call for art, there was extensive history provided on the um, the harbor and the building of it and, and so forth. And it seemed to me to be a close, more closely aligned to Live Oaks history than maybe some people thought. But we can address that in additional educational signage too. All right, thank you. Are there uh, any members of the public that wish to speak to this item? Please approach the podium. Thank you, Becky Steinbruner. You've also heard earlier about this from uh, Ms. Jean Brocklebank, who opposes this uh, for the very reason that you brought up, Supervisor Koenig, that this does not really mirror Live Oak. <laughs> uh, tetrapods at the Harbor is not really Live Oak. Live Oak in the early 1900s was the second largest poultry producing, egg producing location in the state of California, second only to Petaluma. That would reflect Live Oak. Doing something that would hearken to the days of the ranchettes when there were many, many egg producing um, small farms there would hearken to the history of Live Oak. Having some kind of a, a climbable, more kid friendly piece of art would fit this site. I've raised kids and I know they're going to want to climb on this, but it's not going to be kid friendly. Their, their parents or guardians are going to constantly have to admonish them not to touch it <laughs> because it will be hot. It will be messy. This is not, in my opinion, a, a, a kid friendly or family friendly piece of art. And it does not, as Ms. Brocklebank and you yourself, Supervisor Koenig pointed out, does not really hearken to or reflect the Live Oak history. So I, while I appreciate the effort of the artist and the commission, I feel it is inappropriate to put this in a very kid-friendly, family-friendly location. And that does not reflect the history of Live Oak itself. I remember a few years ago at Scotts Valley Library seeing um, 
rotating very large sculptures outdoor and they were amazing made out of recycled materials so i think um, we need to take a second look at this not spend ninety five thousand dollars on this sculpture because i really don't think it fits and i don't think it serves the public well we only need to look at the whale at the Nat museum of natural history and know that people love that and it is approachable and it is something that uh, is very public friendly, and that's what this sure. piece of art needs to be. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments on Zoom? Yes, we do. Michael Lewis, your microphone is now available. Yes, this is the real Michael Lewis this time. Um, I'm particularly disappointed with the selection of this project um, without casting any aspersions on the artist at all. Um, I find this a, an ironic selection for reasons that Becky just uh, elucidated, and also because this um, this celebrates a project that was environmentally destructive. It resulted in the destruction of a, a working lagoon and wetlands uh, that no longer exist anymore, and also required the use of cement, which is one of the greatest producers of um, greenhouse. greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the witches were very much trying to control nowadays. So I find the, the selection of this uh, inappropriate. It celebrates the wrong things in our culture. We're moving away from this sort of thing now. We're considering our environmental effects, what we do more. And I think, and also it ignores the, the history of Live Oak as a rural area. And those of us who live here in, in uh, Live Oak, enjoy the rural character that still exists. And we, de we decry the destruction of that character. So I then, and particularly since there were other uh, proposals that did indeed celebrate the rural character of Live Oak. And I'm just disappointed that this selection was made and I hope you can uh, send this back for uh, a little more consideration. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers on Zoom. Rural is the key. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll return it to the board for action. Um, you know what? I, I, again, with with uh, no slight meant for the artist who who I think his work is artistically of high merit, um, but just it falls a little short here of, of celebrating Live Oak's culture and history. What I'm interested in doing is. Um, accepting the funds, but using them to provide for a rotating exhibition at the Live Oak Library Annex, uh, including an ongoing annual competition for as long as funds allow to acquire, display, and preserve artwork to celebrate Live Oak's culture and history, uh, and advertise that program broadly in the community, including at local schools, understanding that artwork must be created uh, independent of an instructor. Uh, I'll make that as a motion, um, and if there's uh, issues with it that need to be considered, um, Happy to do so. Yes, Mr. Chair, let me just say that, I mean, this is your district, and so I wanna uh, respect this, uh, what your recommendation is. And, and I'll ask Ms. DeWild, can you just explain to us, I know you briefly said that the project manager to Chair Koenig's question uh, had recommended an outdoor piece. Can you just explain uh, for the community what the process is? We, we had a call for artists who was selected by the Arts Commission, it was selected specifically by a staff member, and then that recommendation comes to us. What's the commonplace on modifications for this? What's the library's role within this versus just the county's role? Just so we can have a sense also for what Supervisor, or excuse me, Chair Koenig is recommending um, for context. Hello. Um, I, uh, I know that Damon Adlau is on this call as well, um, or perhaps he's even there in person and he might be able to speak to his conversations with, with library staff about placement of the, the public art for this project. He might be better able to address that. Yeah, he's approaching now. Hi, I'm Damon Adlau, Community Development and Infrastructure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, as far as when the, the RFP went out, it was primarily, I think it was um, primarily open. So we were open to proposals that were in the exterior or interior. I think the primary focus was um, representations um, of the natural and built environment. So it was fairly open and then also a history component. So um, I think the 
the uh, panel was interested in outdoor, um, uh, some of the outdoor proposals, primarily in creating kind of a new place um, for the campus. So just kind of thinking a little bit beyond the annex itself, but also integrating the uh, Simpkins, um, the Boys and Girls Club, the new rail trail, potential rail trail, um, and creating a place in Live Oak. So I think the attraction of having something on the out, uh, the exterior um, was something we kind of focused on. But again, I think the proposal went out was pretty open-ended. And is there space within the building? Um, to you know, there, display hung art or have display cases? Or there's anything. definitely space for two-dimensional art, absolutely. Um, not necessarily for three-dimensional, but just a comment on that. I think that it would have to be, we would have to um, involve the library. They also have a separate policy um, for art exhibitions. So that would have to be something that'd be coordinated between our current policy and then the library's policy. Okay. Mr. Chair, if I can make a suggestion, but feel free to um, disagree with it. It just strikes me that maybe this just needs to go back a little bit toward the, um, we need to kind of restart the process in regards to this. I mean, it, it may be that what you're recommending makes sense. It may also be that we just uh, go back and have a, another shot at, at, at uh, a new set of proposals that maybe you're, you're more actively involved um, because I mean, it, not that I'm saying that you weren't, I'm just saying that it just realistically, this kind of comes to us the Thursday before a Tuesday meeting with a proposed piece of art. So, you know, um, I think that what make more sense uh, would be to just, uh, and I can take uh, Damon's suggestion on this, if, if accepting the funding, if, if that half makes sense, and then just moving it back and remanding it in essence for another call to artists and redoing that process, especially if it can be done in a relatively expedited fashion might make more sense. But I'll leave it what your thoughts are on that, Mr. Chair. I just, the, the reason I'd ask the concern or question about the library is that I don't want to limit what your vision is, as, as you were talking about a rotating exhibition. And I know at least in the Aptos library, I mean, there's been a lot of limitations of what can or can't go up on the walls and the library has an active role in that too. And so I don't want to create another issue associated with just what your recommendation is. Okay, thank you. Um, then let me try to, to put this together here. Um, then I'll, I'll withdraw my previous motion and move that uh, we accept the funds from Measure S today, uh, which would be in line with recommended action number two. Um, and then uh, to confer with the library on, to understand um, what would be possible in terms of uh, allowing for a rotating exhibition at the annex, Live Oak Library Annex, um, and um, ask the Arts Commission to. Uh, Re, I guess restart the process with the consideration that um, taking into account what was learned from the library um, and considering whether or not the um, acquisition of art pieces could be acquired over even multiple art pieces could be considered or um, over multiple years. Uh, yeah, that, that's clear to me. I mean, I, I would second that motion. I'll ask council to confirm that it's within our flexibility to be able to, to do this today. Yes. Thank you for that succinct answer as always. And so, um, and so Damon, I want to make sure that, uh, sorry, Mr. I want to make sure that, that, that this is direction is, is clear in a way that is something that you can also work with. I understand that you've been under a lot of request that we expedite these processes from each of our offices. And I understand this is delaying something, but just uh, making sure that this is also clear for you. It's clear for me. Okay. And Chair Cohen, I would just encourage, I mean, I imagine you're going to, but I think just having an open role in these discussions would be very helpful. Also moving forward, I appreciate you working on that. So I will second that motion. All right. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously.
Thank you. And now we'll proceed to item 10 to consider selection of Paul Cheney, DBA Cheney Metals Inc. as the public artist for the Aptos Library Project. Adopt resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $120,000 from Measure S, $120,000 from Measure S funding. Approve agreement with Cheney Metals Inc. for an amount not to exceed $106,000 and to take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Parks, Open Spaces and Cultural Services. And for a presentation on this item, uh, we have Amy Miyakusu, Arts Commissioner, and Paul Cheney, the artist. Uh, my apologies for forgetting the camera the first time there. Uh, once again, my name is Amy Miyakusu. I am an Arts Commissioner for Santa Cruz County. And I would like to, um, excuse me, let me restart that. The Arts Commission is pleased to recommend for your approval another amazing artist. Um, this proposal is for the new Aptos Library. The call to artists went out in late 2021 and a selection panel was convened. The selection panel met in February to review the artist proposals received by the due date. Uh, three artists were chosen to continue in the selection process by meeting with the panel and an artist was selected to continue in that process. The Arts Commission at their March 7th meeting asked the panel to reconvene and asked the artists to provide more detailed information about their concept proposals. The artists also created additional materials to further describe their proposals. After much deliberation, uh, the panel chose Paul Cheney to continue in the selection process. And at their March 23rd meeting, the Arts Commission reviewed the panel's decision and voted to recommend that your board approve the selection of Mr. Cheney as the public artist for the Aptos Library. I'd like now to introduce Mr. Cheney um, of Cheney Metals, who will give a brief presentation of his proposal and then also answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Cheney, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to do this work. Um, uh, it's um, kind of surprising after to be here now. So at any rate, uh, do you have any questions about what I'm gonna do? and uh, how it's gonna be accomplished. Any questions from members of the board? Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Look, Mr. Cheney, um, these are two separate and distinct uh, projects and needs and, and, and uh, the Aptos Library falls within my district. It's an absolutely exciting project. Uh, you know, we, we just had demo this week and so we've we've officially begun it i think that that uh your proposal is is stunning my my son i showed it to him he's seven and he's excited to go into the new children's room and he saw i explained to him the metal fabrication he's very excited about it so uh, i support your proposal i appreciate you you helping create uh memorable public art pieces for the renewal of a project that it's long overdue and and creating a new hub for aptos to have for the next 30 years or so so uh, great appreciation for you for submitting to this, and I'm looking forward to supporting uh, your proposal. Okay, thank you. All right, if there are no further questions or comments, uh, are there any comments from members of the public? Oh, God. <laughs> Hello, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. I'm a resident of Aptos. And um, this is the first I've heard about this. <laughs> I guess I've been so uh, preoccupied with worrying about salvage of the demolition that I didn't pay attention to um, the art that was coming down the pike. Um, I see that it's going to be um, silicon bronze. What is the texture of that material? Is it kid friendly? This is gonna be, one of them is gonna be in a kid's garden. Um, the teen panel, um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite have time to read all of the, the materials. If you could please just talk about the materials and the size. Uh, the kid's garden is going to be 84 feet long, and the other one is um, over that. So this is going to be substantial art. If you could please just talk about the material, uh, the texture, if it will be kid-friendly, and um, if, if it's how it will weather in the salt air that it will be uh, exposed to. I like the designs that I see in your renderings. They're beautiful. And they do reflect the um, 
natural environment of the Aptos area. So I think they're very beautiful and I'm anxious to see them, but I would like to know a little bit more about what they will be like and where they will be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Are there anyone on Zoom who wishes to comment? We have no speakers on Zoom at this time. All right, I'll turn to the board for action. Yeah, I'll move the recommended actions. Uh, the questions actually are within the artist proposal here, um, the drawings and the dimensions and such and, and the material fabrication, but I'll, I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Caput. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Koenig. Aye. Aye. Thank you. That item passes unanimously. All right. And we'll proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cheney. Proceed to item 11. We'll continue the public hearing to consider certification of the vote results for county service areas number 16, Roback Drive, number 21, Westdale Drive, number 26, Muir Drive, number 36. Uh, Sorry, 26 Muir Drive, number 36 Forest Glen, zone C and F, number 46 Pinecrest, number 55 Riverdale Park Road, and CSA number 58 Ridge Drive. And take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. I'll officially open the public hearing. And for presentation on this item, our Deputy CAO, Matt Machado. Thank you, and good morning again, Chair Koenig and Supervisors. And so as you described, uh, the item before you is a certification of votes for the county service areas, as you described. Thank you for that. Just a quick background uh, for uh, just a report here. Uh, back in February, on February 15th, the, your board did approve the engineer's report. Uh, you also set the public hearing on April 12th. And on that day, uh, you took testimony and uh, accepted ballots uh, for the proposed benefit assessments for these listed uh, CSAs. Uh, you did. You then continued the public hearing to, to today, and uh, today we do have the tabulation of the election results uh, in the board letter. Uh, we have described each district and the results of those um, ballots. Uh, the recommended action today is to accept certification of the vote results for CSAs 16, 21, 26, 36, 46, 55, and 58. Uh, secondly, to adopt resolutions authorizing and levying an assessment for road maintenance and operations within CSAs 16, 21, 26, 36, 46, 55, 50, and 58 for fiscal year 22, 23, and uh, each year following. And thirdly, to adopt the resolution confirming previously established benefit assessment for road median maintenance, all within CSA number 36. Uh, for the 22-23 fiscal year and each year following uh, fiscal um, CSA 36, uh, they oppose the, in, the proposed increased assessment. So that's why that uh, last recommended action is slightly different. Uh, with that, I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Questions from members of the board? Seeing none, I'll open it for public comment. Any members of the public wishing to comment on this item? And here in the chambers, is there anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom for this item. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Supervisor Friend, second by Supervisor Coonerty. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you. I'll proceed to, I, uh, I'll close the public hearing. I will now proceed to item 12, consider a report on Thrive by Three initiative and nurse family partnership and direct staff to report back on or before December 13th, 2022 with fiscal year 21-22 program <laughs> evaluation as outlined in the memorandum of the directors of health and human services. And for a report on this item, we have our HSD director, Randy Morris. 
Um, yes, good morning, Chair Koenig and board members. I am one of four um, people presenting today, and if the clerk of the board could help me, um, I have three colleagues who are going to be co-presenting with me uh, virtually. First is um, Health Service Agency Assistant Director Jen Herrera. Um, second is Health Service Agency Public Health Manager Susan Paradise. And finally, um, First Five Director David Brody. Um, and I see them being logged in. Thank you. Um, so in front of you today is the first update since the pandemic on the Thrive by Three program. And before um, giving this presentation, I just wanna pause to recognize sort of a human element in this. Um, this is a program that's been uh, up and running in response to a board action five years ago. And as a newer member of this community in the last two years, and in fact, in preparing to give this presentation, it really strikes me how much uh, heart and passion went into this presentation. And I think as staff in preparing this, we felt strongly we would be remiss if we did not take the moment to recognize Allison Endert from Supervisor Coonerty's office, who was a big part of the heart and passion. And having lost her um, a couple of years ago, I think we just wanted to pause for a minute and recognize her role in um, helping what you will hear about today has been a, a wonderful program. So with that said, um, today's agenda, if you can go to the next slide, thank you for helping. Um, today's agenda is gonna cover three quick topics. So even though there's four of us, we hope to be able to do this in about 10 minutes. Uh, first is a little bit of background because we haven't been here in the last couple of years. Wanna just sort of explain to the, uh, public and to community sort of what this program is and what's happened in the last five years, leading to the second uh, topic, which is um, highlighting some accomplishments. And I just want to take a moment to highlight two. One is how much the work that preceded the pandemic helped uh, some of our most vulnerable families who have children zero to three during the pandemic. Um, and then second is how much this program has grown um, over the last five years, which we have a slide about. Um, and then we will close out with what us uh, first five health and human services are thinking of some of the next steps and opportunities as we look forward to invite some uh, comment and from the public and from your board um, and give us any feedback. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen Herrera, who was the former public health director and now assistant director, who's had a big role in this to start with the background. Good morning, is my sound coming in okay? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Morris. Uh, so first, some background. Thrive by Three is an early childhood fund that was established by the board in January of 2017 with direction to invest those funds in the earliest years of childhood from prenatal stage uh, to through three years old, which is the most rapid and critical period of brain development. It's an investment in evidence-based two-generation approaches that achieve breakthrough outcomes for young children facing adversity. And it's an integrated comprehensive prenatal to three system of care, particularly among children and families facing the greatest barriers to thriving. These investment strategies are intended to support the following community level outcomes. First, we wanna ensure that all babies in Santa Cruz County are born healthy. We are monitoring countywide indicators related to this community level impact, such as early prenatal care and babies born full term and at healthy birth weights to gauge how we're doing overall as a county. We also want to ensure that families have the resources they need to support children's optimal development. Countywide indicators uh, for this goal include monitoring um, access to high quality care and early learning opportunities and access to economic and self-sufficiency supports. We want to ensure all young children in our county live in safe, nurturing families. We still need ways to measure this at a countywide level using indicators such as parenting, competent, parenting confidence and practices, parent-child relationships, and parent and caregiver emotional well-being. And ultimately, we want to ensure that all children are happy, healthy, and thriving by age three. Although there are several ways to measure health and well-being, we're paying particular attention to the rates of child maltreatment and, and entries into the foster uh, care to gauge our prevention efforts. Thrive by Three's desired outcomes are built upon some basic building blocks. The system of care takes a whole child, whole family approach to identifying strengths and needs at the earliest point possible. Uh, it uses linkages to a coordinated system of care. And it's built on a strong, sustainable foundation of partnerships with mutual accountability, high quality programs, and a results-based framework. 
And lastly, it leverages resources and creates equitable opportunities for young children and families to experience the eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. And next, we're going to, in the next few slides, we're going to cover um, a co recent accomplishments of the Thrive by Three system of care. So as Director Morris mentioned, a major accomplishment has been the leveraged investments over the past few years. Since the start of Thrive by Three, the initial $350,000 investment and intentional focus on strengthening the prenatal to three system of care has allowed for increased investments with the additional, with the funding projected to be about 1.4 million next year. Additional funding has come from a variety of areas, including the CalWORKs Home Visiting Program, which is received through the Human Services Department, the California Home Visiting Program Grant received through the Health Services Agency, the Home Visiting Coordination Grant received through First Five, and emergency funds received through throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, which includes funds from the City of Santa Cruz Children's Fund. And next, I'd like to introduce Susan Paradise, who directs our Children and Family Health Unit in HSA's Public Health Division. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can. Great, thank you. Um, so Thrive by Three has served as a catalyst for increasing our county's capacity to provide intensive care coordination through a network of home visiting programs. These programs are Nurse Family Partnership, Public Health Field Nursing, families together and early Head Start. Collectively, <clears throat> we served 1,077 families in 2019 and 2020. Our home visiting programs, <clears throat> excuse me, provided parents with information, support and referrals to community resources and services in multiple core conditions and promote greater health and well-being of families. This was crucially, crucially important in 2020. Uh, even through COVID-19 and the CZU Lightning Complex fires, when all of our county public health nurses were deployed doing case investigation and then providing care in the fire shelters, we continued to work with our partners on strengthening coordination among the home visiting programs and other early childhood and family support services. With the support of our county, children's behavioral health staff, we were able to virtually convene our home visiting learning collaborative for specific training on how home visiting staff could support our families around COVID-19 and mental health. As you can see here in this picture, <laughs> this is a real picture, uh, we reached out to our community partners, including Central Coast Alliance for Health and Second Harvest Food Bank for grants to provide diapers, wipes, food and formula to all of our partners in the collaborative in order to assist our families struggling with the economic losses that accompanied the fires and the pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, we also leveraged the CalWORKs Home Visiting Funds to provide items to help our first time moms continue to teach and have fun with their children safely at home. And our NFP families kept our hearts happy by sending us their photos. We also coordinated with our County Human Services Department to obtain free laptops and computer training for our NFP families through the CalWORKs Home Visiting Program funds. And lastly, we found creative ways to celebrate the accomplishments of our families. Um, as Super, Supervisor Coonerty knows, we held two drive-through NFP graduations and graduated 54 new families since the last time we've come to the board. Now I'd like to introduce David Brody, Executive Director for First Five Santa Cruz County to tell you about enhanced system capacity and coordination. Good morning, everybody. Just a sound check. You can hear me? We can. Very good. Um, thank you, Susan. Again, David Brody, Executive Director at First Five Santa Cruz County. Um, as this board knows, First Five manages a number of elements of the Thrive by Three initiative, including the Early Learning Scholarships, or ELLs. Um, as a reminder, ELLs are designed to provide enhanced funding to licensed <clears throat> excuse me, infant and toddler care providers who provide state subsidized care to children of low income in our community. And this care takes place both in center-based and in family child care settings throughout the county. Um, the basic goal of ELLs is to help close the gap 
between the true cost of providing safe and high quality care and available state subsidies. Um, since the beginning of the program, uh, when, when Thrive by Three started in 2017, we've distributed over $360,000 to local child care providers, including some $175,000 in the last two fiscal years. Um, this funding goes directly to providers, the majority of whom provide care in in-home based settings and the, and the significant majority of whom reside in South County. Um, these are flexible funds. It can be used for things like program supplies, facility improvements, professional development, or strategies to attract and retain staff, particularly relevant during COVID, whatever is necessary to support the provision of high quality care. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we at First Five also leveraged this program and our experience with it in distributing cash grants to child care community uh, to quickly stand up an emergency response fund that provided additional cash grants uh, to any licensed child care provider within the entire county who continued to serve children of essential workers uh, during the pandemic. And we are very proud to say that on top of the ELS uh, funding that's been distributed, we distributed over $732,000 from various sources uh, in that emergency response funding. And again, really our capacity to do that all built on the foundation of the Thrive by Three experience and the ELS program. So with that, I'd like to move over to another program, uh, our Healthy Steps program. Next slide, please. So Thrive by Three has supported the adoption of Healthy Steps in our two safety net clinics, uh, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers and Salud para la Gente. Healthy Steps um, is an evidence-based interdisciplinary primary care program that partners with pediatric care providers to support parents and improve the health and well-being of babies and toddlers in our community. The model centers around uh, team-based well-child visits where physical, developmental, social, emotional, and behavioral health screenings are conducted on a routine basis. And as Dr. Uh, Devin Francis from Salud para la Gente noted just last week at our advisory committee meeting, Healthy Steps is really a model that helps to operationalize and enhance the American Academy of Pediatrics Bright Futures recommendations for the care of young children. Um, while also providing wraparound care, including early learning resources, parenting support, and even economic supports and housing. So really in line with uh, the efforts of our Thrive by Three initiative. Launched in 2019 with a training provided by the Healthy Steps, Healthy Steps National Office, funded by Thrive by Three by this county, um, both clinics have continued to implement and grow that model even over the course of the pandemic. Um, next slide, please. And finally, I want to briefly highlight um, our oversight and implementation uh, infrastructure. Um, our Thrive by Three efforts have been grounded uh, or guided by an advisory committee, which also serves as the Nurse Family Partnership or NFP Advisory Board. Um, the advisory committee typically meets on a quarterly basis and sometimes holds joint meetings with other bodies uh, with shared interests and goals. Um, we also convene a monthly leadership team meeting with key implementation partners, including CalWORKs, uh, health services agencies, public health, of course, us at First Five, Encompass Community Services, uh, the Health Improvement Partnership, as well as the safety net clinics we mentioned. Um, with that infrastructure over the course of the pandemic, we've intentionally aligned and collaborated with other similar systems building initiatives, including the ACEs or Adverse Childhood Experiences Aware uh, work led by your public health division, as well as the Child Abuse Prevention Work Group um, led by your Family and Children's Services Division. Importantly, Thrive by Three has provided a framework uh, for us at First Five to obtain additional funding, um, like the Home Visiting Coordination Grant that was mentioned earlier from First Five California. And we've aligned um, that work with our Thrive by Three efforts, and, those, and, and that grant has allowed us to continue to draw, sorry, we'll continue to draw on that grant as we flesh out changes and, and evolution of this initiative, including the potential expansion to a Thrive by Five framework. Um, in short, even over the course of the pandemic, we have continued to work uh, creatively to integrate and draw on new resources and to strengthen the foundation of the system of care for our county's youngest children and families. So with that, I'd like to turn it um, back over to Director Morris. And next slide, please. And one more. All right, so this closes the presentation, um, which is just sharing with your board and the public three areas that we as staff are looking forward to as we look at uh, the next chapter of our Thrive by Three work together. And I just make a quick comment on all of them and then turn it to the board for comment. Um, first is community engagement. Um, the landscape has changed significantly since Thrive by Three started, the pandemic being just one piece of that. 
And I just want to also mention there are some major um, funding and policy moments on the horizon, one at the state level, which is funding for low income families enrolled in the Medi-Cal program, the entire system is being reorganized under a program called Cal AIM. And at the federal level, as Director Brody just mentioned, um, child abuse prevention is a piece of this. And a major piece of federal reform is going to take place that will change the landscape of child abuse prevention that our department will be managing called the Families First uh, Prevention Services Act. So with this changing landscape and with all the different um, committees and forums that exist, it strikes us as a really good opportunity to look at where we are and look at what Thrive by Three can be uh, to adapt to this landscape. And then the second part of community engagement is we really wanna take some time to figure out a way to meaningfully um, engage parents in this um, community engagement effort to get their feedback to hear what is happening for them. The second on data, um, we do have a lot of data. There's a lot of programs, there's a lot of initiatives, a lot of funding streams, there's a lot of data and we do a good job pulling it together, but we think we can do more. Um, sometimes it's not always aligned and coordinated together and there's also work to be done around data sharing, which often gets stuck with um, confidentiality and protection issues. So we want to focus on data alignment so we can have good data and tell a better story. And finally, as Director Brody just said, um, at their commission meeting, they talked about um, the possibility of shifting from a Thrive by Three model to a Thrive by Five model, which would broaden the population to up to five years old. And that is because it aligns with a lot of federal and state policy activity. And even when you look at the governor's um, May revise in the budget, there's a lot of focus on children up to five years old. So that would be part of our work forward is do we want to shift even the name of the program? So with that, the last slide is just a question and answer. I turn it back to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Director Morris and team. The questions from members of the board. Yes, Mr. Chair, if I may just briefly, uh, first, great deep appreciation to the staff that work on this issue and also to Supervisor Coonerty, who has been uh, relentless in making this a, a key priority for him uh, during his tenure on the board. And, and I know that this board, even after Supervisor Coonerty, uh, steps down to the game next year will continue to make this a priority because it's been created as a system that that we believe in. And I just want to also acknowledge something that, you know, so often it seems that we're rewarded uh, as policymakers in responding to crisis situations, but there really isn't a reward for pre-investment in issues. Uh, it's very fitting to have Mr. Brody on here, whose entire life work is, is dealing with issues and investment before there are necessarily problems. And, and if you want anything, that, I, I don't know that there could be anything more proven than the scientific value of early investment in our children, and not just the first three, but the first five, uh, and the outcomes throughout an entire life are uh, just pay absolute dividends in, in health and socioeconomic outcomes uh, as a result of it. But too often it feels as though uh, government response um, and in fact, we actually have an item following this that just really follows with issues that as we're dealing with a crisis as opposed to how do we prevent the crisis in the first place because policymakers really aren't rewarded for preventing things that the community isn't aware of first. And so I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, Supervisor Coonerty had the leadership to do this, but also that um, our, our health and human services staff and our nonprofit uh, based partners are really taking the lead on this. So just it's just a, a, a great amount of gratitude. There are children in our community that are going to grow up with fundamentally different outcomes because of the investments that the county is doing today. They may have never realize it, but that's really what we should be here to do as policymakers. And so this is a very, uh, a very timely and, and wonderful item. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Friend. Yeah, Mr. Professor Chair. Or, go ahead, Supervisor McPherson. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to re, um, repeat what uh, Supervisor uh, Friend said uh, so eloquently as usual, but, uh, you know, to th thank the Supervisor Coonerty and the late Allison Indert, who was phenomenal in uh, pushing this, and uh, to make th Thrive by Three a reality, get ahead of it. Uh, and I also want to thank um, our executive director, uh, David Brody and First Five for joining in. What a great cooperative effort this has been. Um, we can't uh, do enough to support our younger people in our community through investments that are designed to ensure them and their families uh, to have access to the resources and opportunity that they need uh, to thrive. Um, I hope we can expand this program in the future and uh, thank you for everybody. What a great cooperative effort and thank you again, Supervisor Coonerty for really pushing this and getting us ahead of the curve in serving the youngest in our community. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. 
Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I'll just say uh, thank you also to everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you. I want to take, uh, first of all, thank you, my colleagues, for the um, kind words and appreciation to the staff who's done all the work to make this uh, program successful. I want to thank uh, Director Morris for recognizing the role of Allison Ender uh, as, a, as a driver, the heart and soul of, and mind behind this program. Uh, and I'm really astonished at the level of work and the growth that you all have been able to do um, even during uh, pandemics when staff is being pulled in a million different directions, just trying to meet uh, basic needs. I had a couple of questions, which was, uh, I think, uh, well, let me just say, first of all, I think if we could mandate that uh, every presentation have a, a picture of a baby with every for every chart and graph we see, um, it would make all of our presentations much, much better. Um, but, uh, but I think the second part uh, is... Um, certainly expanding to thrive by th thrive by five makes a ton of sense, um, if nothing else, for the alliteration, but uh, mostly for the policy. Uh, as many of us know, as parents, um, it doesn't necessarily get any easier after three. Uh, and so providing that extra support and resources to kids as they prepare to enter the school, um, I guess um, with the expansion, are the resources that you have adequate. You don't want to reduce the commitment that <clears throat> that we made to the zero to three. Um, if we expand by five, we want to continue to um, provide as, as much or more resources for zero to three and also four to five. So can, can you talk about what that resource allocation would look like if we go in that direction? I'm I'm looking at the video screen to see if either of my colleagues want to start. Uh, I'm wondering if David, if we can call you out as our first five director, it seems appropriate to ask you to jump in to focus on this. Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I don't have a specific or a, 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 a super detailed answer to that, but I think probably no surprise to the board. Um, yeah, if, if you expand services or expand access to services, you want to have resources to support that. Um, uh, with that said, uh, I think part of what we need to um, utilize resources for is to step back and really take this opportunity to take a comprehensive look at the full scope and scale of all of our services and supports to children zero through five in their families, inclusive of first five and uh, many uh, federal and state programs that flow resources to our community and ensure that we're making best utilization of those resources. Um, you know, that's just incumbent on us uh, as responsible parties uh, overseeing public funds. Um, but basically, you know, but with that said, certainly, um, there is uh, a market, so to speak, for additional support um, for young children and families in this community. And it frankly is hard to imagine that ever being a poor choice in terms of increasing that level of investment. And, and I would like to piggyback in a conceptual way to say a touch more about the, the state and the federal reform efforts that may, to be determined, bring new resources to our community. So starting with the federal reform um, of the child welfare prevention wing, if it lands as expected, the state is still working with the federal government to get the state plan approved. Um, so we will know that in the next year. It allows for foster care systems in California to reinvest money that would otherwise be at the back end of the system to increase investments in prevention entering the system. So that's a con concept, but that's to me part of the um, engagement work we would do looking at what is happening going forward to make sure we're not just spreading the dollars from zero to three to zero to five, but we're adding new resources. And I think there's some promising policy budget issues on the horizon that might make that come a reality. And thank, I think you covered part of my next question, but um, my sense of it is, is you have these uh, federal and state changes that are coming down as well as pre-K uh, implementation, which will be a major change that could have uh, po po a lot of positive effects and some ripple effects across child care providers and other uh, services. Um, but I also get a sense that there's a lot of philanthropic interest in this area and um, that Santa Cruz, because we're a little bit ahead of the curve, can we leverage um, our leadership to, to get additional investment um, for some of these programs? 
if we have, especially if we have good data. David, are you about to answer? Yeah, I mean, briefly, yes. Um, and actually, without naming names, there's some large philanthropies that have um, disengaged somewhat from our county in recent years with respect to zero to five. And I think if we are strategic, we can re-engage those philanthropies as well as engage, you know, as, as, as you suggest, Supervisor Coonerty, um, a number of interested parties that want to support this type of very smart preventative investment uh, as, as Supervisor um, Friend alluded to. That's, that's all my questions. I look forward to hearing from the community and then bringing it back for um, accepting and additional direction. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, we'll open it now for public comment. Any member of the public wishing to comment on this item? Um, seeing none here in the chambers, is anyone on Zoom? We have no speakers on Zoom for this item, Chair. Okay, then I'll return it to the board for action and we do have a recommended action as Supervisor Coonerty said. Sure, so, um, so I'll move the recommended action with additional direction uh, that staff uh, expand Thrive by Three to Thrive by Five uh, increase uh, data uh, collection and alignment um, and identify the necessary, um, what additional resources will be necessary in order to uh, maximize leveraging funds and impact in the community. Second. I'll second. Motion by Supervisor Coonerty, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? Seeing none, clerk, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Sorry, aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously as amended with the additional recommendation. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the team from first three and now first five uh, for presenting. Um, or th thrive by three, now thrive by five, as well as first five. Um, we'll now proceed to item 13 to consider report on planned collaboration with the city of Santa Cruz on its proposed use of $14 million of one-time state funding to help people experiencing homelessness in the city of Santa Cruz secure stable housing as outlined in the memorandum of the Director of Human Services. And once again, we have our Director of Human Services, Randy Morris, uh, as well as Robert Ratner, our Division Director of Housing for Health on the line. Um, yes, so to a very different topic, but lots of energy and interest in this topic as well. Um, and just if the uh, clerk of the board could elevate Dr. Robert Ratner, who I see he has been. So he is available remote for question and answer, but I'll give the presentation. Um, and this is an action that is only to accept and file the report. Um, and the materials outline some details of this transaction, which um, as I will share in a little more detail, um, we were fortunate that our state Senator John Laird and assembly member Mark Stone last state fiscal year were successful in having $14 million of state funds earmarked specific to the city of Santa Cruz. And I wanna underline that the money was appropriated to the city of Santa Cruz but there was an expectation that how the city would use those funds would be done in collaboration with the county. So that's where we come in. What this report is about is what our role was in working with the city as they look to how to use that $14 million. Um, I'm gonna uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the process and I do wanna make sure your board is aware and the public is aware that um, this presentation is intentionally after the process played out and um, the city brought forward their recommendation to the city council on March 8th and the city council approved the recommended actions, but I'm gonna walk through sort of how that how that uh, played out. So, um, and we do, I'm sorry, yeah, we do have a PowerPoint. Um, don't know if that's up. Yeah, and I'll just pause for a moment so the PowerPoint can be seen because I'm going to start on the first slide. Oh, thank you. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is just kind of a quick um, overview of what played out. Um, so as I said, we're very fortunate to have our state senator and state assembly member who worked very hard. Um, a little bit of context behind this, if um, 
people are not aware, the way um, some of the state formulas are applied to how funding for um, homelessness services are distributed are not necessarily based on the actual um, volume of people experiencing homelessness in a community, but the size of the population. So that disproportionately sends state money to a community like Santa Cruz County, where the population might be small, but the number of people experiencing homelessness is large. And that was a recognition of our state leaders that they wanted to sort of calibrate some until and if there's change in the state formula. So that was a piece of what led to um, their successful um, uh, negotiations to get this $14 million to our community. Um, this state Senator Laird in particular, who has a history of formerly being uh, the mayor of the city of Santa Cruz and a um, board member, um, also was very aware from his own personal experience as an elected officials and now three jurisdictions that there needed to be um, better collaboration and alignment of work between the city and the county. So he included an expectation and made it very clear and convened a video meeting with all of us that this needed to be done in a collaborative effort. So what were the purpose of the funds? Um, we were advised that there needed to be investments in lasting infrastructure, not just immediate interventions that the money went away and didn't have any lasting improvements. That those outcomes, uh, there would be outcome focused um, in the collaboration and that everything that this $14 million would do would be completely aligned with um, the collaboration of our strategic plan that your board has um, passed and that everything the city was doing would sort of line up with um, the issues that we're working on together. So what was the planning for the use? Um, I'm going to walk through what the process was, and then I'm going to end with what the city recommended and the city council passed. So the process. First, there was multiple staff meetings, and I want to highlight the staff from the county that rep, uh, were represented were not only myself as the human services director, Dr. Ratner as the housing for health director, but also our CAO, Carlos Palacios, saw how important this was, and he participated in almost every one of the meetings. So the full county leadership was participating as staff. And then the other is um, I want to make sure the public is aware of what something called the two by two is. Um, many people who are um, pay attention to this do know, but for those who don't, in January of 2018, your board um, and the city council at the time both passed um, the creation of a two by two committee, which by definition was um, the mayor and the vice mayor of the city of Santa Cruz and two board members um, from the county. And at present, um, that is District 3, Ryan Coonerty, and District 5, Bruce McPherson. So that structure exists. That's a monthly meeting. And early on in the pandemic with all the COVID sheltering, we actually moved it up to two times a month. So as soon as uh, these funds were made available, we immediately used that committee structure because that committee uh, is focused on issues that overlap between the city and county for a place to have conversations and bounce ideas off our uh, shared um, elected officials. Um, the process then led to multiple meetings, some conceptual agreements, and then the city held um, items at their city council sharing publicly um, how their efforts were moving forward to look at how to invest the $14 million. And once we reached agreement between um, staff and with our shared elected officials at the two by two committee, uh, the city manager then contacted our two state officials to explain to them where we are to get their approval. Um, and at that point, the city manager brought forward the item at March 8th at the city council. So that was the process. And we'll go to the next slide to describe at a very high level what the investments are, but they can be seen in the March 8th materials at the city council where they're more detailed. So they basically break down into some short-term investments and some long-term investments. So this is the second to last slide, some short-term investments. Um, as many are aware who are tracking this issue, um, city and county share in this issue, but the city in particular has been trying to address issues that are often named encampments, but we're going to call it public space safety management and resource connection. Um, we have the encampment right behind this building as one of the prime examples and largest examples in our community. So one of the short term investments was it struck us as county staff and working with the city um, that they actually had a very humane and well informed um, set of protocols for how to address encampments, but they did not have the staff to actually execute the protocols. So we fully supported in the discussion, um, they're building their capacity to be able to actually implement plans in a humane way that supports people who are homeless in encampments. So that was um, the first. The second, um, and this has been a topic of great debate and discussion at the city council meetings, um, the city has directed staff in the city to develop safe sleeping and parking areas 
And so this was a, a revenue stream to invest in that. So that was the um, second item in the short term. And then the, the last item is Coral Street. Um, the Coral Street area, which has a combination of county services and investments, city um, investments, and then our nonprofit um, housing matters, all three groups um, see this as the best location to really advance our navigation center services. Um, so there was some um, agreement of that 14 million to invest in some short-term um, items like camp, some campus improvements, uh, repairs to a hygiene bay that are there, and then the, the purchasing, and this is a transition to some longer term, of some pallet shelters to expand some um, shelter capacity um, in, at the area. So the next slide, which is the last slide, is as we were instructed, um, tied to the purpose of the funds, is some long-term investments. Um, so the first was there was a recognition that there is a lot of state and federal money being made available to develop um, properties to have for um, shelters and affordable housing, but there are some organizations that need some pre-development funds to, to the city's credit. They wanted to make these funds available to not just city projects, but countywide. So there was a $500,000 uh, pre-development fund set aside that is in the process of being put out to the community to help support um, project development. And then the last two are Coral Street. Um, the second to last one is there's obviously a footprint there and some property surrounding that, that if acquired could expand the footprint. Um, and that is money that the city has asked to purpose for a property acquisition. And then the last is a master plan design process. There is money from the 14 million set aside to pull all three of our parties together, the county, the city and housing matters to do what's called a design charrette to look at how to organize that campus to maximize um, the way it is serving those that we wanna serve. And then this is also a necessary precursor we anticipate to a, hopefully a, a future project home key application because the state has in its budget more home key funds. So if we can get that, that work done and get a good design, we think we will be very competitive to even bring in more money to um, make that location the best it can be. So if you go to the last slide, that closes it out and we open it up to any questions. And again, Dr. Ratner is here, depending on what questions you have, he's been the one working um, most specifically with the city on all these details. So thank you. Thank you, Director Morris. Questions from members of the board. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I just want to um, begin by thanking our CAO, Carlos Palacios, for his commitment to not only owning up uh, the county's role in their responsibility in addressing the homelessness issue, but uh, to also ending the rancor that had existed for many years between the county and the city on this issue. It's very difficult. Uh, uh, every re uh, just reaches out to every part of our community um, and is ev evidenced in this, by this agreement, as well as the overall housing for health blueprint that has been agreed upon uh, by the city and county. Uh, we're now collaborating in ways that um, I haven't seen in many years since we started this. Um, and that's due no, to no small part to the work of the Human Services Director, Randy Morris, who made the presentation and our Housing for Health Director, uh, Robert Ratner. Um, they've been working diligently with counterparts at the city to approach this challenging issue, I think strategically and cooperatively. It's a very complex one. And I also wanna acknowledge my office's strong partnership with Supervisor Coonerty and his staff in representing the board on the two by two community throughout the years. Um, we've, we're, we're in a better place than we have been in the future or in the past. Um, uh, we have a really good re re working relationship now with the city. And I think it's gonna set the tone for how we execute um, this. And I especially wanna uh, acknowledge the work of former mayor Donna Myers who brought about this funding from the state and Senator John Laird. Uh, and for making the request to get this one-time funding. Uh, so it's critical that we have this as a starting point. And the, the trick will be how we sustain the funding uh, for our partnership going forward. That's gonna be the key element of all this. Uh, we have a great plan, but not everything we need to fund it. So I'm hopeful our community will become more competitive for funding once we can demonstrate how much uh, we can get accomplished and the resources that were allocated. But this is a tremendous start. It's unusual in the state. We're, um, we just have to see uh, and show everyone else how well this can work. So thank you to everyone who was involved in this. It's been a, a long process and uh, it's gonna take some time to resolve it in the long term as well. So thank you to everybody who's been involved. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. 
Supervisor Coonerty, do you want to add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, first, uh, first of all, I want to thank um, staff. The coordinated effort um, is important, and I think the investments reflect uh, a good sense of both the needs in our community as well as the desire to make long-term investments as well as uh, short-term, more short-term uh, responses to crisis on the ground. Uh, I, th I think, I, I, I guess, let me just... I, offer a little bit of context, having done this now for a lot of years. Um, I think this kind of investment is great. It is a, a drop in the bucket compared to what is needed uh, going forward. We could have 10 times this investment every year for 10 years. Um, we'd be able to both help a lot of people and we probably wouldn't see much improvement on the ground in terms of um, uh, encampments in our public parks and neighborhoods and uh, and open spaces. Um, the systems are uh, are fundamentally broken in the state of California, especially around the areas of mental health and substance abuse. Um, and so uh, it is. Um, I think this is an important step forward, but I also think we need to set. Uh, appropriate expectations for everyone in the community, but for those who are uh, unhoused and seeking services, for those who uh, are frustrated with the lack of progress they see, um, this is going to be a uh, require a, a statewide or even national investment of billions and billions of dollars over the coming years, as well as fundamental changes in our, both our criminal justice system and our mental health and substance abuse systems. Um, we're doing our part in Santa Cruz to try to piece together these fragmented resources and, and help people in need and, and reduce impacts in our community. Uh, this is this is a step in that direction, um, but but we should understand just how big of a problem not only Santa Cruz but but really the nation and especially the West Coast uh, of the United States uh, is facing uh, in this crisis of homelessness. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Caput. Uh, great, uh, great uh, work, Randy. Uh, you and your staff uh, want to wish you the best here on this uh, planned collaboration. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, we're we're facing problems from all different directions, and it's uh, good to know you uh, you and your staff are working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. I just have a, some few questions. Um, you know, the first is I understand the city's goal in uh, this plan is you know, they, they had a slide at their March 8th meeting that said um, you know, one of the differences the community is going to see is that San Lorenzo Park will be a park again, um, which of course means uh, removing the encampment that's there presently. Um, I think I've heard estimates of about 300 uh, or so tents uh, in the San Lorenzo encampment at this time. Um, in looking through some of the new shelter services that are going to be set up, um, it seems, and, and my, my numbers might be off here, but um, you know, about 100 um, spaces of new pallet shelters at Housing Matters campus, 75 um, or so spaces at the Armory, um, I believe some, somewhere around 40 at the River Street camp. Um, that only comes out to about 215. Um, and so my question is, where is everyone going to go? I, I've heard significant concerns from community members that uh, clearing the camp uh, in June, uh, July timeframe, right before fire season really um, kicks in, um, is, is going to be a disaster because it's going to push people uh, into the riparian areas again, um, where fires are more likely to start. So uh, the question is just on basic capacity. Are we going to have enough of beds to um, actually uh, effectively clear uh, or the San Lorenzo camp uh, safely? Uh, I'll queue up a high level answer and then ask Dr. Ratner to follow through. I'm, I'm going to just key off of Supervisor Coonerty's pragmatism. This and Supervisor Ch and Chair Koenig, a perfect question. Thanks for your candor. Because, I mean, now that we're administrators of the local Housing for Health office, we want to not lose hope, but we also want to be practical because this is a complex issue. My cue up for Dr. Ratner is um, what the city is doing is one piece of an ecosystem and it's trying to detail 
shifting from people being in encampment into other identified shelter spaces. What needs to be balanced into that, and this is the part where it's, you know, our optimism and hope, and we have some modest progress that we've seen during the um, COVID sheltering system that we have been able to help some people get into affordable housing. So that's the complementary piece. And I'd like to queue up Dr. Ratner, the success we've had um, both in partnership with health and um, getting some grants in our other grant that we received, which um, has 65 slots to help people who are in the San Lorenzo River area to actually not move to another shelter, but into housing. So the ideal, and I'm underlining this is the ideal, this is the optimism, is to be able to have a plan for everybody. But if somebody had a way to execute this, this problem wouldn't exist and we'd all be replicating it. So Dr. Ratner, if you want to fill in the details with um, the encampment response grant and then anything else you'd like to add. Sure, I appreciate the question. And I think that uh, Supervisor Koenig's math is accurate, that there's not going to be a one-to-one -one ratio of dedicated temporary beds to the numbers of people that we have estimated sleeping in the park. But there are other resources that Randy alluded to. So the encampment response grant that we received from the state, which is also a byproduct of this collaboration, uh, we're working with our community provider after the authorization from the board to execute a contract. So there'll be 70, 75 slots for participants in that program. And the focus will be on people living in the encampment area. And the board has also approved of the Healing the Streets effort um, with County Behavioral Health and Front Treat as our nonprofit provider. So we're mobilizing those resources as well. Um, and uh, Randy alluded to our partnership with uh, the healthcare system. The state has invested a lot of resources into housing is a healthcare issue in partnership with our managed care plans throughout the state. So for us in Santa Cruz County, that's the Central California Alliance for Health. And some of the organizations we're working with are connected in with the Alliance and a lot of the individuals who are living in the camp are eligible for Medi-Cal. Um, health insurance are already on Medi-Cal and that comes with housing navigation services, some money for housing deposits. So our hope is piecing all these things together, we'll have pathways to offer to everyone that's in the park currently. And uh, we, we don't have great data on the needs of folks in the park. For example, we have some early indications that there's been an increase in the number of veterans who are unhoused in our community. So linking people up with the programs they're eligible for, um, particularly there's a significant number of resources for veterans. So I think as we do more outreach and get to know people in the camp, um, I'm hopeful that we can have pathways for everybody. Not always a uh, temporary shelter, but um, the options I alluded to. And I think the last thing I'll mention is we created that centralized, flexible housing fund um, for people who need help with deposits or maybe moving back with family and friends out of the area. Um, so all those things we're planning to deploy to try to support the work that the city is doing in the, in the park. Okay, thank you. Um, I know another uh, part or outcome of the March 8th discussion by the city council um, was uh, uh, directing the mayor to write a letter. I haven't seen this letter, but uh, I believe it was asking the county for more assistance with safe parking spaces. Is that accurate? Uh, you, you can go ahead, Robert. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think Supervisor Koenig there, I've definitely heard from staff the talk of this letter, but I have yet to see a letter <laughs> come to us with that formal request. Um, and, and if I can just break down, just maybe I'll ask if um, to make sure we're understanding your question. Um, safe parking breakdown between RV and cars is an issue cities and unincorporated areas all throughout California are struggling with. And I just wanna break down and see if this is part of what your question is. Identifying a physical piece of property is one thing. Identifying services and community support for that area, are the, those are the package of all kinds of activities. So I would just say um, the conversation since I've been here in two years, all of those parts need to be broken out to determine who's doing what. Um, the question has come up now and again about available um, physical locations, but what goes along with that is um, community support and then services if necessary. So that, that I just want to confirm um, when that letter comes, we'll certainly be engaged through the two by two committee if it's a city issue. Um, but that's what we'll be tracking is what the ask is. Okay, I mean, the question really is, you know, is there more that we can do to provide safe parking spaces or other space for shelters? Um, I mean, you mentioned that really the crux of the issue is not just having the, the physical property, the real estate, 
um, but having the funds to manage the program. Um, the city's budget includes a million dollars for uh, for a safe parking program, uh, one million dollars of forty nine thousand. Um, is there? A, is, do you know if the city's funds uh, or, or if those funds are already allocated or is those funds that we could take advantage of in offering some kind of safe parking program uh, through the county? So I'll ask Robert if he's been in that level of detail. And I, I think you've confirmed what my question is because um, there's paying a provider to be able to help support people there. There's questions about county health and human services and some of the grants robert mentioned outreaching to people if they're in a particular area and then there's actually the physical property that's the one that's pulled me in the most about identifying particular physical spaces that could be used during certain hours and none of those have led to a formal agreement but those are ongoing conversations but robert if do you have any more specificity in terms of where we are with those discussions uh, I think there's um, operational and policy questions. Uh, like who are the target populations for the safe parking um, <clears throat> programs that the city is proposing? I, I think to answer one of your questions, Supervisor Koenig, I believe that city staff are still working on identifying locations um, either in the city or outside the city boundaries that would be appropriate. Um, there, there's also been requests for options for people who are sleeping in their RVs, but when you work with RVs, you need to have a location that can accommodate that kind of need as well. Um, and the additional expenses related to that. So I think, um, from the accounting perspective, there's still openness to looking at partnering with the city on finding locations outside their boundaries, but we need to think about who they're planning to refer and operational details. And I think there's some policy questions there around whether um, county elected leaders such as yourself want to have safe parking for people who are parking in city boundaries coming to another part of the county when we also have people sleeping in their vehicles in unincorporated areas of the county. So that there's a policy issue around location of where these programs are and how they're funded over time that I think we may be bringing back to the board at a later point if we come up with specific locations. Okay, sounds uh, sounds like it to be continued as as more specific proposals emerge, but um, there are some you know there are some resources available there, so so expect to see something in the future. Um, my final question is about uh, employment opportunities. Um, when I had an opportunity to visit the COVID shelter that we managed at the Armory, um, what struck me most was, you know, it's a fantastic shelter, uh, people were being fed, had a place to stay, uh, you know, stay, shower, um, but they didn't have anything to do other than wait around for the shuttle back into town. Um, meanwhile, here at my office at 701 Ocean Street, I'd look out the window um, at the folks camping in San Lorenzo uh, camp and see people climbing trees, digging ditches, uh, cutting firewood, um, just being industrious and maybe in all the wrong ways. Um, but it struck me that this is very much a part of human nature uh, to want to be uh, productively engaged in some activity. Um, so, you know, we had an item early on, on today's agenda, $750,000 for goodwill. Um, I, I'm not, if um, for some kind of a displaced worker program, I don't know if that would be relevant at all. Um, I'm just curious, are there, uh, this board has allocated funds from the American Rescue Plan uh, for job training programs. Um, are there opportunities uh, to further, um, I don't know, do outreach for these sorts of employment programs uh, at any of the shelter or, or housing facilities we're contemplating here? Um, I'll make a couple high level comments and same ask Robert to fill in on some detail. Um, first is, uh, this is something that struck me too, Supervisor Koenig early on and I kind of had my own aha moment when people like you and others kind of ask questions about what's going on at the shelters, just going back to resources and the categorical nature of federal and state funding. The COVID shelter system out the gates was thought to be a couple week thing and we'd co uh, trace ourselves out of a pandemic. And so none of the funding included anything other than paying for the shelter. So by definition, what you literally saw was what we were paid to do. So the issue is then stitching together and braiding together and weaving together other services to which there weren't funding. So that's kind of the context of the COVID shelter systems were never thought to be two years. Um, they were thought to be the short term, don't get COVID and spread anyhow, you know, lesson learned. 
Um, I would say one benefit, I don't know if this was part of uh, my boss and Carlos's vision, but moving um, the Housing for Health Office to Human Services leads to an answer to your question, which is having the Housing for Health Office embedded with where the Medi-Cal eligibility determinations are done, where our Workforce Development Board is, and where we have some other programs creates an opportunity to start answering that question better. And I'll end with one concrete example um, because I've been in conversation particularly with um, Supervisor McPherson's office. So I'll cue you up for this if you don't know your staff are calling me about this. But I think you're familiar with the North County Downtown Streets team. And in South County um, Community Action Board CAB has a program Watsonville Works. And the funding behind some of those programs come from a federal allocation that runs through the Human Services Department called uh, the acronym is CFET, CalFresh Employment and Training. So those dollars, if you can find local match dollars in both of those city um, programs, the downtown streets team and the Watsonville program have city match dollars and then our partners in health come in and match as well. And you put that together and by definition, that is to CalFresh or CalFresh eligible clients to help them with employment and training. So we are in the process of trying to stitch together and braid together those programs with the Housing for Health Division, which if we do it right, will better get to, I think what the answer to your question is, making sure there's an intentionality between getting those programs connected with um, outreach to people in an encampment. So we hope we get, we move further along. But Robert, do you wanna fill in any details as well? This is a, it's big on me. There's a lot of people and there's not enough services. Uh, I think it's a great question. And I think um, I've um, realigned with the idea of bringing resources to people who are on housing, including opportunities for meaningful activity and employment. And um, I think one of the things that we articulated in our memo to the board is the need to move toward more kind of service enriched programming for folks who are unhoused and not, not just um, having shelter alone, but bringing employment opportunities, access to health care coverage, health services to where people are and linking them with those opportunities. And, and Randy I mentioned a, an example of that. I think the Homeless Garden Project is an example of another longstanding program where there's been links to education and training and work opportunities for folks. So I, I really appreciate you raising it, Supervisor Koenig, and I think it's an area we can keep, keep working toward increasing those connections between the work we're doing with people who are unhoused and those employment opportunities that the board has supported through other action. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments from members of the board? Seeing none, uh, we'll open it for public comment. Please approach the podium. Hello, my name is Becky Steinbrenner. I'm a resident of Rural Aptos. Thank you, Mr. Morris, for your great reports. They are always the best. And um, I, I am really... Um, as a rural resident, also concerned about if there are not enough places for the Benchlands um, residents to go, that they will go into the wildland. Puganip has always been at risk of that happening, and we've seen many fires there. So I am heartened that you are all mindful of that as well. Um, I really think that we need to accommodate people, maybe in smaller clusters, I've talked with a number of homeless people. Many of them are not comfortable in going to a big place like this with 300 residents. There's gang activity, prostitution, drugs. They don't want to be there. But if there were smaller clusters and, and these people have their own friends, their communities, they, they could be accommodated in smaller clusters, maybe more uh, spread out around the city and not concentrated in the Coral Street area, which is already a problematic area. Um, I think we would have more people willing to go to those spots. I also think, and thank you, Supervisor Koenig, uh, Chairman Koenig, for bringing up the, the issue of idle hands. And I feel that we could encourage these people to um, become part of our wildland vegetation training crews. They could go out and do trail maintenance, vegetation for fire, removal for fire defensible space and get real hands-on experience, networking that could get them jobs. I'd like to see us partnering with local businesses and um, industrial complexes to maybe have them come in as apprentices and get their feet in the door 
with networking that could lead to other jobs. I'd like to see mobile mechanics come around to the um, broken down cars and RVs and work with the owners to get them working again. And I'd like to see portable toilets along Delaware where the people go. Um, and and uh, have them have a, a dignified place and that is more sanitary for the public. We do need to get buy-in from the tenants and they need to feel that they have worth. They need to gain um, necessary um, life skills so that they can get themselves out of this. We don't want to give just a simple handout. We want a hand up. Thank you, and Ms. that's I what I think you're working very hard at doing, Mr. Morris, and I, I applaud you. Are there any members of the public on Zoom? We do have speakers on Zoom. Serge Cogno, your microphone's available. Good morning, Chair Koenig, Board of Supervisors. My name's Serge Cogno, co-chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board, though these comments are mine alone. Supervisor Caput, on a side note, I spoke with your assistant on Friday, attempting to schedule the meeting we spoke of. Look forward to hearing back from you for a date and a time. Uh, great thanks to the, for the presentation and the work from Randy and Robert. As you all know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. I, I applaud this collaboration to increase trauma-informed services to provide the most respectful, empowering, and outcome-driven services as possible. What is not trauma-informed is that these services that the city is moving forward with are coupled with criminalization of homelessness with both the city's camping ban and the city's recreational vehicle plan. There's a logical disconnect. On the one hand, to claim services are trauma-informed, while on the other hand, to criminalize people, all suffering from various forms of, various forms of trauma or understandably resistant to services. Some participants with mental health challenges are consistently discriminated and exited and banned from programs. They're often exited from programs for not being able to function with staff who have limited training, and they have limited recourse without an independent grievance process provided by the county. They then become subject to the city's anti-homeless ordinances. I encourage the Housing for Health Department and the Board of Supervisors to stand firm in their collaboration with the city that trauma-informed care be a requirement through service, throughout the services and ordinances by both the city and county. I would also like to point out that the county has its own anti-homeless ordinance 10.40.120, which is a county overnight recreational vehicle ban, which the Coastal Commission staff notified county staff was against the Coastal Act. I bring this up so that the county can bring itself into compliance, but also to support multiple elements of the county strategic plan by basing all services and ordinances as trauma-informed. Please ensure that we encourage our city partner and that we also use a trauma-informed philosophy in all of our efforts equitably managing our homeless crisis and supporting those challenged with mental illness. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cagno. We have no further speakers for this item, Chair. All right, then I'll return it to the board for action. I'll move for approval. Second. Motion by Supervisor Caput, second by Supervisor Friend. Any further discussion? I'll, I'll just say, I mean, we're obviously in active communication uh, and collaboration with the city and um, you know, any proposals that, that they want to share with us for ways to create more beds or safe parking spaces. Um, you know, looking forward to reviewing those. All right. If there's no further discussion, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Koenig? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Director Morris. That brings us to the end of our regular agenda. Our next regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be June 7th, 2022, 9 a.m. Uh, Tuesday in these chambers and on Zoom. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>